Preface, Note, and Introduction of The Irish Nuns at Ypres, An Episode of the War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Irish Nuns at Ypres, An Episode of the War, by Dame Mary Columban. Preface the following narrative was originally intended as a record of the events it relates for the use of the community only but shortly after the arrival of the mother prioress in england the manuscript was placed in my hands i soon formed the opinion that it deserved a larger circulation my friend reginald smith shared this view and so the story has come before the public it is in truth a human document of thrilling interest and will i believe make an abiding contribution to the history of this world-wide war dmc although a novice in literary work describes with graphic force the transactions in which she and her sisters played so conspicuous and so courageous a part the moving pictures which pass before our eyes in her pages are full of touching realism and throw curious sidelights on the manifold aspects of the titanic struggle which comes home to every one and everything the heroism the self-devotion the religious faith the christian zeal and charity of those irish nuns at Ip in a terrible crisis in the history of their order will i venture to say command universal respect and admiration mingled with pity for their fate and an earnest desire among all generous souls to help them in retrieving their fortunes a note by the prioress and an introduction by mr redmond who amid his many onerous occupations is not unmindful of the duty which irishmen owe to the historic little community of irish nuns at ypres form a foreword to a narrative which belongs to the history of the times the illustration on the cover is a reproduction of the remnant still preserved in the convent of one of the flags captured by the irish brigade at the battle of ramilla on this subject i have added a note in the text there are names in belgium which revive memories that irishmen cannot forget fontenoy and landon are household words ypres too brings back recollections associated with deeds which mark the devotion of the irish people to faith and fatherland r barry o'brien one hundred sinclair road kensington west may nineteen fifteen note by prioress these simple notes destined at first for the intimacy of our abbey we now publish through the intervention of mr barry o'brien to satisfy the numerous demands of friends who owing to the horrors of the fighting round ypres have shown great interest in our welfare owing also to the numerous articles about us appearing daily in the newspapers and which to say the least are often very exaggerated i have charged dame mary columband to give a detailed account of all that has befallen the community since the coming of the germans to ypres till our safe arrival at olten abbey i can therefore certify that all that is in this little book taken from the notes which several of the nuns had kept is perfectly true and only a simple narrative of our own personal experience of the war may this account to which mr redmond has done us the honor of writing an introduction at the request of dame teresa his niece bring us some little help towards the rebuilding of our beloved and historic monastery which this very year should celebrate its two hundred and fiftieth anniversary mary mara o s b prioress april nineteen fifteen introduction i have been asked to write an introduction to this book but i feel that i can add little to its intense dramatic interest ypres has been one of the chief centres of the terrible struggle which is now proceeding on the continent and it is well known that this same old flemish town has figured again and again in the bloody contests of the past it may perhaps be well to explain in a few words 
how the tide of war has once more rolled to this old world city on sunday june twenty eighth nineteen fourteen in sarajevo the capital of bosnia the archduke francis ferdinand of austria-hungary and his wife the duchess of hohenberg were assassinated although it was known throughout europe that there was in existence in serbia an anti-austrian conspiracy not of a very formidable character and although suspicion pointed towards the assassinations being due in some way to the influence of this conspiracy no one dreamt for a moment that the tragedy which had occurred would have serious european consequences and as a matter of fact it was not until july twenty three that the austro-hungarian government presented an ultimatum to serbia on that day however a note of a most extraordinary and menacing character was delivered to the serbian government by austria-hungary it contained no less than ten separate demands including the suppression of newspapers and literature the disappearance of all nationalist societies the reorganization of government schools wholesale dismissal of officers from the army and an extraordinary demand that austro-hungarian officials should have a share in all judicial proceedings in serbia besides the arrest of certain specified men and the prevention of all traffic in arms it at once became evident to the whole world that no nation could possibly agree to these demands and maintain a semblance of national independence and when it was found that the ultimatum required a reply within forty-eight hours it became clear that the whole of europe was on the brink of a volcano great britain through sir edward grey had already urged serbia to show moderation and conciliation in her attitude towards austria-hungary and when the ultimatum was submitted to her great britain and russia both urged upon her the necessity of a moderate and conciliatory answer as a matter of fact serbia agreed to every one of the demands in the austro-hungarian ultimatum with only two reservations and on these she proposed to submit the question in dispute to the hague serbia received no reply from austria-hungary and immediately on the expiration of the forty-eight hours the austro-hungarian minister quitted belgrade during those forty-eight hours great britain and russia had urged one that the time limit for the ultimatum should be extended and that germany should join in this demand but germany refused sir edward grey then proposed two that great britain france germany and italy should act together both in austria-hungary and in russia in favour of peace italy agreed france agreed russia agreed but germany again held back sir edward grey then proposed three that the german italian and french ambassadors should meet him in london italy and france agreed russia raised no objection but germany refused on july twenty nine the german imperial chancellor made to the british ambassador in berlin the extraordinary and historic proposal that great britain should remain neutral provided that germany undertook not to invade holland and to content herself with seizing the colonies of france and further promised that if belgium remained passive and allowed german troops to violate her neutrality by marching through belgium into france no territory would be taken from her the only possible answer was returned by great britain in the rejection of what mr asquith called an infamous proposal on july thirty one the british government demanded from the german and french governments an undertaking in accordance with treaty obligations to respect belgium's neutrality and demanded from the belgian government an undertaking to uphold it france at once gave the necessary undertaking as did belgium germany made no reply whatever and from that moment war was inevitable 
on monday august three the solemn treaty guaranteeing the neutrality of belgium signed by germany as well as by france and great britain was treated as a scrap of paper to be thrown into the waste paper basket by germany belgian territory was invaded by german troops and on the next day tuesday august four german troops attacked liege from august four to august fifteen liege under its heroic commander general lehman barred the advance of the german armies and in all human probability saved paris and france and the liberties of europe on august seventeen the belgian government withdrew from brussels to antwerp on august twenty brussels was occupied by the germans on august twenty four namur was stormed on august twenty five louvain was destroyed and after weeks of bloody warfare after the retreat from mons to the marne and the victorious counter-attack which drove the germans back across the aisne and to their present line of defence antwerp was occupied by the germans on the ninth of october on october eleven what may be called the battle of ypres began in real earnest but the town defended by the allies held heroically out and by november twenty the utter failure of the attempt of the germans to break through towards calais by the ypres route was acknowledged by every one during the interval ypres was probably the centre of the most terrible fighting in the war this delightful old flemish town with its magnificent cathedral and its unique cloth hall probably the finest specimen of gothic architecture in europe was wantonly bombarded day and night the germans have failed to capture the old city but they have laid it in ruins the following pages show the sufferings and heroism of the present members of a little community of irish nuns which the world forgetting by the world forgot has existed in ypres since the days some two hundred and fifty years ago when their royal abbey was first established it is true that during those centuries ypres has more than once been subjected to bombardment and attack and more than once les dames irlandaises of the royal benedictine abbey of ypres have been subjected to suffering and danger but never before were they driven from their home and shelter why it may be asked is there a little community of irish benedictine nuns at ypres during the reign of queen elizabeth three english ladies lady percy with lady montague lady fortescue and others wishing to become religious and being unable to do so in their own country assembled at brussels and founded an english house of the ancient order of st benedict their numbers increasing they made affiliations at ghent dunkirk and pontoise in the year sixteen sixty five the vicar-general of ghent was made the bishop of ypres and he founded there a benedictine abbey with the lady marina beaumont as its first lady abbess in the year sixteen eighty two on the death of the first lady abbess lady flavia carey was chosen as the first irish lady abbess of what was intended to be at that date and what has remained down to the present day an irish community at that time the irish had no other place for religious in flanders a legal donation and concession of the house of ypres was made in favour of the irish nation and was dedicated to the immaculate conception under the title of gratia dei irish nuns from other houses were sent to ypres to form the first irish community from that day to this there have been only two lady abbesses of ypres who have not been irish and the community has always been so far as the vast majority of its members are concerned composed of irish ladies its history which has recently been published contains the names of the various lady abbesses they are practically all irish with the familiar names butler o'brien ryan mandeville dalton lynch and so on 
in sixteen eighty seven james the second of england desired the lady abbess of the day lady joseph butler to come over from ypres to dublin and to found an abbey there under the denomination of his majesty's chief royal abbey in sixteen eighty eight the lady abbess accompanied by some others of the community at ypres arrived in dublin and established the abbey in big ship street leaving the house at ypres in the charge of other members of the community it is recorded that when passing through london she was received by the queen at whitehall in the habit of her order which had not been seen there since the reformation in dublin james the second received her and granted her a royal patent giving the community house rent postage free and an annuity of a hundred pounds this royal patent with the great seal of the kingdom was in the custody of the nuns at ypres when this war began it was dated june five sixteen eighty nine when william the third arrived in dublin in sixteen ninety he gave permission to the lady abbess lady butler to remain but she and her nuns refused saying they would not live under a usurper william then gave her a pass to flanders and this particular letter was also amongst the treasures at ypres when the war broke out notwithstanding william's free pass the irish abbey in dublin was broken into and pillaged by the soldiery and it was with difficulty that the sisters and the lady abbess made their way after long and perilous journeys home to their house at ypres they brought with them many relics from dublin including some old oak furniture which was used in the abbey at ypres up to the recent flight of the community and so the irish abbey at ypres has held its ground with varying fortunes in january seventeen ninety three forty or fifty armed soldiers broke into the abbey but the lady abbess of the day went to tournay to seek aid from the general-in-chief who was an irishman he withdrew the troops from the convent the following year however ypres was besieged by the french but although the city was damaged the convent almost miraculously escaped without injury an order for the suppression of convents was passed in the very height of the revolution the heroic lady abbess lynch died she was succeeded by her sister dame bernard lynch and the community were ordered to leave they were however prevented from so doing by a violent storm which broke over the town and next day there was a change of government and the irish dames and the irish abbey were allowed to remain and for several years the irish abbey was the only convent of any order existing in the low countries so it has remained on to the present day from the year sixteen eighty two down to nineteen fifteen when for the first time during that long period this little irish community has been driven from ypres and its convent laid in ruins among the other relics and antiquities treasured by the community at ypres at the opening of this war was the famous flag so often spoken of in song and story captured by the irish brigade in the service of france at the battle of ramilla a voluminous correspondence with james the second a large border of lace worked by mary stuart a large painted portrait of james the second presented by him to the abbey a church vestment made of gold horse trappings of james the second another vestment made from the dress of the duchess isabella representing the king of spain in the netherlands and a number of other most valuable relics of the past all these particulars can be verified by reference to the rev dom patrick nolan's valuable history this little community is now in exile in england their abbey and beautiful church are in ruins some of their precious relics are believed to be in places of safety but most of their property has been destroyed they escaped it is true with their lives but what is their future to be surely irishmen to whom the subject especially appeals 
and english sympathizers who appreciate courage and fortitude will sincerely desire to help those devoted and heroic nuns to go back to ypres the home of the community for over two centuries to rebuild their abbey and reopen their schools to continue in their honourable mission of charity and benevolence and to resume that work of education in which their order has been so long and so successfully engaged john e redmond april nineteen fifteen end of introductory material chapters one and two of the irish nuns at ypres by dame mary columban this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter one the coming of the germans the war with all its horrors into which the emperor of germany plunged the world in august nineteen fourteen had been raging nearly six weeks when towards the end of september vague rumours of the enemy's approach reached us at ypres several villages in the neighbourhood had had visits from the dreaded uhlans and according to report more than one prisoner had avowed that they were on their way to ypres an aeroplane had even been sent from ghent to survey the town but had lost its way in these circumstances the burgomaster sent round word that from henceforward until further orders no strong light should be seen from outside and no bell should be rung from six in the evening till the following day consequently when night came on the monastery remained in darkness each nun contenting herself with the minimum of light and a few strokes of a little handbell summoned the community to hours of regular observance instead of the well-known sound of the belfry bell which had for so many years fearlessly made known each succeeding hour another result of the burgomaster's notice was that we were no longer able to say the office in the choir as on one side the windows looked on the street and on the other to the garden the light being thus clearly visible from the ramparts we therefore said compline and matins first in the workroom and afterwards in the chapter house placing a double set of curtains on the windows to prevent the least little glimmer of light from being seen from the outside an uneasy feeling of uncertainty took possession of the town this feeling increased as news reached us in the first days of october that the enemy had been seen several times in the neighbourhood at length on october seven a never-to-be-forgotten day for all those then at ypres a german aeroplane passed over the town and shortly afterwards at about one thirty p m every one was startled by the sound of firing at no great distance in the monastery it was the spiritual reading hour so we were not able to communicate our fears but instead of receding the sound came nearer till at two o'clock the shots from the guns literally made the house shake unable to surmise the cause of this sudden invasion we went our way trying to reassure ourselves as best we could shortly after vespers the sound of the little bell called us all together and reverend mother prioress announced to us to our great dismay that what we had feared had now taken place the germans were in the town some poor persons who came daily to the abbey to receive soup had hastened to bring the dreadful tidings on hearing the bell ring for vespers because an order had been issued of which we were totally ignorant that no bells might be rung for fear of exciting suspicion the poor often more unselfish and kind-hearted than the rich showed themselves truly so on this occasion being more anxious for our safety than their own one poor woman offering her little house as a shelter for lady abbess she had only one penny for all her fortune but still she was sure that everything would be well all the same for as she wisely remarked the germans were less likely to think of pillaging her bare rooms than our splendid monastery the cannonading which we had heard at one thirty was a gallant defence made by one hundred belgian police who had been obliged to retreat before the fifteen thousand germans who from two till eight p m 
poured slowly into the affrighted town chanting a lugubrious war song monsieur colette the burgomaster and the principal men were obliged to present themselves it was arranged that the town would be spared on the payment of seventy-five thousand francs and on condition that no further violence should be offered monsieur colette and another gentleman were kept as hostages we looked at one another in consternation we might then at any moment expect a visit and what a visit what if they were to come to ask lodgings for the night we dared not refuse them what if they ransacked the house would they touch our beloved lady abbess who owing to a stroke she had had two years before remained now partially paralyzed we instinctively turned our steps to the choir there mother prioress began the rosary and with all the fervour of our souls an ardent cry mounted to the throne of the mother of mercy pray for us now and at the hour of our death was that hour about to strike after the rosary we recommended ourselves to the endless bounty of the sacred heart the protector of our monastery cuer sacre de jesus j'ai confiance en vous and putting all our confidence in the double protection of our divine spouse and his immaculate mother we awaited the issue of events our old servant man edmund an honest a fearless and a reliable retainer with certainly a comical side to his character soon came in with news prompted by a natural curiosity he had gone out late in the afternoon to see the troops for the germans as in so many other towns made an immense parade on entering ypres for six long hours they defiled in perfect order before the gazing multitude who although terrified could not repress their desire to see such an unwanted spectacle following the army came huge guns and cars of ammunition and provisions without end the troops proceeded to the post office where they demanded money from the safes the belgian official stated that owing to the troubled times no great sum was kept there and produced two hundred francs the rest having been previously hidden the railway station had also to suffer the telegraph and telephone wires being all cut while four german soldiers posted at the corners of the public square and relieved at regular intervals armed with loaded revolvers struck terror into the unfortunate inhabitants of ypres after some time however the most courageous ventured to open conversation with the invaders amongst the others edmund who coming across a soldier more affable looking than the rest accosted him the german only too glad to seize the opportunity replied civilly enough and the two were soon in full conversation you seem to be in great numbers here oh this is nothing compared to the rest germany is still full we have millions waiting to come we are sure to win the french are only cowards uh, where are you going to when you leave ypres to calais and then to london ha ah, you won't get there as easy as you think they'll never let you in uh, we can always get there in our zeppelins with this the german turned on his heel and tramped off it was now time to think of finding lodgings for the night a great number of horses were put in the waiting rooms at the station destroying all the cushions and furniture the soldiers demanded shelter in whatever house they pleased and no one dared refuse them anything our abbey thanks to divine providence of whose favour we were to receive so many evident proofs during the next two months was spared from these unwelcome visitors not one approached the house and we had nothing to complain of but the want of bread our baker being on the way to the convent with the loaves was met by some german soldiers who immediately laid hands on his cart and emptied its contents we therefore hastily made some soda scones for supper which though not of the best were nevertheless palatable however all did not escape so easily as we did and many were the tales told of that dreadful night the most anxious of all were those who were actually housing wounded belgian soldiers if they were discovered would the brave fellows not be killed there and then 
and it happened in more than one case that they escaped by the merest chance before the convent of exiled french nuns rue de lille whom we were afterwards to meet at our stay in poperingi and where at that moment numbers of belgians were hidden a german stopped a lady who was luckily a great friend of the nuns and asked if there were any wounded there that is not a hospital she replied but only a school and with a tone of assurance she added if you do not believe me you can go and see for yourself the soldier answered oh i believe you and passed on in another case the germans entered a house where the belgians were and passed the night in the room just beneath them a jeweler's shop was broken into and the property destroyed or stolen and in a private dwelling the lady of the house finding herself alone with four officers her husband having been taken as hostage she took to flight on which the germans went all through the place doing considerable damage in other cases they behaved pretty civilly a washerwoman had thirty to breakfast of whom several had slept in her establishment leading their horses into her drawing-room on seeing her little boys they had exclaimed here are some brave little soldiers for us later on and on the mother venturing a mild expostulation they added yes you are all germans now belgo germans while before leaving they wrote on her board we are germans we fear no one we fear only god and our emperor what troubled her the most was that her unwelcome guest had laid hold of her clean washing taking all that they wanted amongst other things our towels had disappeared we were as may well be imagined but too pleased to be rid of the dread germans at so little cost it appears that while the german army was still at ypres some twelve thousand british soldiers having followed on its track stopped at a little distance from the town sending word to the burgomaster that if he wished they were ready to attack the enemy m collette however not desiring to see the town given up to pillage and destruction was opposed to a british advance by this time the whole town was on the qui vive and uh, no one thought of anything else but how best to secure any valuables that they had for the stories of what had happened in other parts of belgium were not at all reassuring several tried to leave the town but the few trains that were running were kept exclusively for the troops while the germans sent back all those who left on foot to increase the panic no less than five aeroplanes passed during the day and the knowledge that the enemy had left soldiers with two mitrailleuses at the port de lille to guard the town completed the feeling of insecurity moreover as the soldiers had literally emptied the town of all the eatables they could lay their hands on sinister rumours of famine were soon spread abroad rev mother prioress sent out immediately for some sacks of flour but none was to be got and we were obliged to content ourselves with wheat meal instead rice coffee and butter we had together with some tins of fish the potatoes were to come that very day and great was our anxiety lest the cart would be met by the germans and the contents seized however the farmer put off coming for some days and at length arrived safely with the load a boy going in front to see that no soldiers were about the milkwoman whose farm was a little way outside the town was unable to come in and no meat could be got for love or money so we were obliged to make the best of what we had and each day mother prioress went to the kitchen herself to see if she could not possibly make a new dish from the never varying meal rice quaker oats and maizena ultimately the allies came to our help and a motor car armed with a mitrailleuse flew through the streets and opened fire on the germans taken by surprise the latter ran to their guns but through some mishap the naphtha took fire in one of them whereupon the germans retreated three of their men were wounded and one civilian killed on the friday we began to breathe freely again when suddenly news came even to the abbey that one hundred germans were parading round the town on sunday the allies came once more to chase them but for the moment the germans had disappeared things continued thus for some days 
until to the delight of the inhabitants the british took entire possession of the town promising that the germans would never enter it again just one week after the coming of the germans the troops of the allies poured in until amid the enthusiastic cheers of the people twenty one thousand soldiers filled the streets those who came by the monastery passed down the rue saint jacques singing lustily here we are here we are here we are again here we are here we are here we are again then alternately each side repeated hello 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 the crowd whose knowledge of the english language did not extend far enough to enable them to grasp the meaning of here we are again soon however caught up the chorus of hello hello and quickly the street resounded with cries which were certainly discordant but which nevertheless expressed the enthusiastic joy of the people end of chapter one chapter two the allies at ypres the contrast between the reception of the two armies was striking on the arrival of the germans people kept in their houses or looked at the foe with frightened curiosity now every one lined the streets eager for a glimpse of the brave soldiers who had come to defend ypres a week before the citizens had furnished food to the enemy because they dared not refuse it and only then what they were obliged to give now each one vied with the other in giving bread butter milk chocolate everything they had went to the soldiers and sounds of rejoicing came from all sides perhaps the most pleased of all were the poor wounded belgians who had been so tried the preceding week all those who were able to drag themselves along crowded to the windows and doors to welcome their new comrades and the latter unable to make themselves understood by words made vigorous signs that they were about to chop off the germans heads what excited the most curiosity were the petticoats as they were styled of the highlanders and every one gave their opinion on this truly extraordinary uniform which had not been previously seen in these parts the soldiers were quartered in the different houses and establishments of the town once more the abbey was left unmolested though once again also the want of bread was felt not that it had been this time stolen but that in spite of all their efforts the bakers could not supply the gigantic demand for bread necessary to feed our newly arrived friends seeing that we were likely to be forgotten in the general excitement edmund was sent out to see what he could find after many vain efforts he at last succeeded in getting three very small-sized loaves with which he returned in triumph scarcely had he got inside the parlor when there came a vigorous tug at the bell the newcomer proved to be a man who having caught sight of the bread came to beg some for his soldiers edmund was highly indignant and loudly expostulated but the poor man with tears in his eyes turned to mother prioress who had just entered and offered to pay for the bread if only she would give him a little i have my own son at the front he exclaimed and i should be so grateful to any one that i knew had shown kindness to him and now i have been all over the town to get bread for my soldiers and there is none to be had mother prioress's kind heart was touched and telling the good man to keep his money she gave him the loaves as well with which he soon vanished out of the door edmund grumbling all the time because the nuns and himself had been deprived of their supper mother prioress laughing told him the soldiers needed it more than we she turned away thinking over what she could possibly give the community for supper she went almost mechanically to the bread bin where lifting up the lid she felt around in the dark what was her delight to find two loaves which still remained and which had to suffice for supper as well as breakfast next morning we retired to rest feeling we were at any rate well guarded and the firm tread of the sentries as they passed under our windows at regular intervals inspired us with very different feelings from those we had experienced the week before on hearing the heavy footsteps of the german watch 
the officials of the british headquarters entered the town with the army and for several weeks ypres was their chief station from which issued all the commands for the troops in the surrounding districts we were not long however in knowing the consequences of such an honour the next day at about ten thirty a m the whirr of an aeroplane was heard we were becoming accustomed to such novelties and so did not pay too much attention till to our horror we heard a volley of shots from the grand place saluting the newcomer we knew from this what nationality the visitor was the firing continued for some time and then ceased what had happened our enclosure prevented us from following the exciting events of those troubled times but friends usually kept us supplied with the most important news it was thus that soon afterwards we heard the fate of the air monster which had tried to spy into what was happening within our walls the first shots had been unsuccessful but at last two struck the machine which began rapidly to descend the inmates unhurt flew for their lives as soon as they touched ground but seizing the first motor-car to hand the soldiers chased them and at last took them prisoners what was their horror to find in the aeroplane a plan of the town of ypres with places marked on which to throw the three bombs one of these places being the grand place then occupied by thousands of british soldiers endless were the thanksgivings which mounted up to heaven for such a preservation and prayers and supplications for divine protection were redoubled since the beginning of the war every one even the most indifferent had turned to god from whom alone they felt that succour could come and those who before never put their foot in church were now amongst the most fervent pilgrimages and processions were organized to turn aside the impending calamity and heedless of human respect rich and poor the fervent and the indifferent raised their voices to the mother of god who has never yet been called upon in vain even the procession of our lady of thin so well known to all those who yearly flock to ypres for the first sunday in august with its groups its decorations its music had been turned into a penitential procession and the kermesse and other festivities which took place during the following eight days were prohibited needless to say the monastery was not behindhand every day the community assembled at one o'clock for the recitation of the rosary and when possible prayed aloud during the different employments of the day numberless were the aspirations to the sacred heart our lady of angels our holy father st benedict each one's favourite patron the holy angels or the souls in purgatory each suggested what they thought the most likely to inspire devotion perhaps the best of all was that which dame josephine requiescat in pace announced to us one day at recreation it ran as follows dear st patrick as you once chased the serpents and venomous reptiles out of ireland please now chase the germans out of belgium the office of the dead was not forgotten for those who had fallen on the battlefield and we offered all our privations and sacrifices for the good success of the allies or the repose of the souls of the poor soldiers already killed we also undertook to make badges of the sacred heart for the soldiers though at the moment we saw no possible means of distributing them at length to our great joy the arrival of the british troops among whom were many irish catholics opened an apostolate for us which went on ever increasing the idea had first come to us when weeks before a number of belgian soldiers were announced of whom two hundred and fifty were to have been quartered at the college reverend mother prioress had then suggested that we should make badges so as at least to help in some little way when every one else seemed to be doing so much we set to work with good will some cutting the flannel others embroidering others writing till at last we had finished what was our disappointment to hear that not a single soldier had come to the college we then tried in every way possible to find a means of distributing our handiwork but all in vain 
till one day a poor girl called helene who washed the steps and outer porch leading to the principal entrance of the convent came to beg prayers for her brother who was at the front mother prioress promised her we should all pray for her brother at the same time giving her a badge of the sacred heart for him together with a dozen others for any one else she might know to be in the same position helene soon returned for more and the devotion spreading through the town every one came flocking to the parlour to get badges for a father a brother a cousin a nephew at the front many even also asking them for themselves so that they might be preserved from all danger even the little children in the streets came to ask for a little heart until the poor sister at the door was unable to get through her other work owing to the constant ringing of the bell in despair she laid her complaints before her superior saying that a troop of children were there again of whom one had come the first thing in the morning for a badge on receiving it she had gone outside where changing hats with another child she promptly returned pretending to be someone else the sister who had seen the whole performance through the guiche had smiled at her innocent trick and given her another but now here she was again this time with someone else's apron on and bringing half a dozen other children with her mother prioress then saw the little girl herself who nothing abashed put out her hand saying de petit coeur s'il vous plaît mon sir this was too much for mother prioress's tender heart and instead of scolding she told them there was nothing ready then but for the future if they came back on mondays they might have as many petits coeurs as they wished the little troop marched quite contentedly out of the door headed by the girl who could not have been more than seven years old and diminishing in size and age down to a little mite of two who toddled out hanging on to his brother's coat the devout procession was brought up by a tiny black dog which seemed highly delighted with the whole proceeding this little digression has brought us away from our subject but was perhaps necessary to show how we were able to send badges to the soldiers by means of this somewhat strange manner of apostolate for a young girl hearing of the devotion brought them by dozens to st peter's parish where an irish regiment was stationed impressing on each man as she pinned the badge to his uniform that it was made by the irish dames End of chapter two chapter three of the irish nuns at ypres by dame mary columban this Dilbervox recording is in the public domain chapter three incidents of the struggle meanwhile in the distance we could hear the sound of cannonading which told us of the approach of the enemy and when we met at recreation the one and only topic of conversation was the war each day brought its item of news such or such a town had fallen another was being bombarded a village had been razed to the ground another was burning so many prisoners had been taken such a number wounded many alas killed as often as not what we heard one day was contradicted the next and what was confirmed in the morning as a fact was flatly denied in the afternoon so that one really did not know what to believe we could at least believe our own ears and those told us by the ever approaching sound of firing that the danger was steadily increasing for the brave little town of ypres it was therefore decided that in case of emergency each nun should prepare a parcel of what was most necessary lest the worst should come and we should be obliged to fly soon crowds of refugees from the towns and villages in the firing line thronged the streets the city was already crowded with soldiers where then could the refugees find lodging and nourishment how were they to be assisted all helped as far as they were able and dinner and supper were daily distributed to some thirty or forty at the abbey doors this meant an increase of work which already weighed heavily enough on our reduced numbers for we had since september eighth lost four subjects one choir dame and three lay sisters owing to the law then issued commanding the expulsion of all germans resident in belgium 
this had been the first shock nothing as yet foretold the future nor gave us the least subject for serious alarm when on the afternoon of september seven an official came to the parlor to acquaint us with the newly published law and to say that our four german nuns would have to leave within thirty-six hours we were literally stunned benedictines enclosed nuns all over twenty-five years in the convent what harm could they do surely no one could suspect them of being spies telegrams flew to bruges even to antwerp to obtain grace all was useless and at three thirty p m september eight we assisted at the first departure from the abbey which we innocently thought would be at the worst for about three weeks little dreaming what we should still live to see these first poor victims were conducted by our chaplain to his lordship the bishop of bruges who placed them in a convent just over the frontier in holland where we continued corresponding with them until all communication was cut off by the arrival of the germans as has already been stated in the result we find our labors increased by the loss of our three lay sisters but we divided the work between us and even rather enjoyed the novelty poor old sister magdalen our oldest lay sister however failed to see any joke in the business and when she found herself once again cook as she had been when she was young and active her lamentations were unceasing we tried to assist her but she found us more in the way than anything else she discovered at last a consoler in the person of edmund who offered to peel apples pears and potatoes and when the two could get together sister magdalen poured forth the tale of her endless woes into edmund's sympathetic ear whilst he in turn gave her the latest news and it was a curious spectacle to see the two together in the little court anxiously examining a passing aeroplane to know of what nationality it was though which of the pair was to decide the matter was rather questionable edmund being exceedingly short-sighted and sister magdalen not too well versed in such learned matters to return to the refugees mother prioress took some of us to help her in the children's refectory and with her own hands prepared the food for them for dinner they had a good soup with plenty of boiled potatoes bread and beer for supper a plate full of porridge in which we mixed thin slices of apple which made a delicious dish and then potatoes in their jackets bread and beer we had to work hard for it was no small task to get such a meal ready for about forty starving persons we left sister magdalen to grumble alone in the kitchen over the mysterious disappearance of her best pots and pans especially one evening when forgetting to turn the appetizing mixture which was preparing for supper we not only spoilt the porridge but burnt a hole in a beautiful copper saucepan the sound of hostilities came ever nearer and nearer dreadful rumors were current of an important battle about to be fought in the proximity of ypres what made things worse was the great number of spies that infested the neighborhood daily they were arrested and yet others managed to replace them four soldiers and one civilian kept a vigilant watch on the town examining every one who seemed the least suspicious as much as the prisoners themselves Rouler, Wanneton, Dismoud, and uh, countless other towns and villages had succumbed, and at last, to our great relief, news reached us that the Germans were in Bruges and had taken possession of the Episcopal Palace, and our much-beloved bishop, where was he? Alas, we were doomed not to hear, for all communication was cut off, and for the future we only knew what was happening in and around Ypres, and was it not enough? the windows already shook with the heavy firing the roar of the guns in the distance scarcely stopped a moment from the garret windows we could already see the smoke of the battle on the horizon and to think that at every moment hundreds of souls were appearing before the judgment seat of god were they prepared terrifying problem as everywhere else the german numbers far exceeded those of the allies it consequently came to pass that the latter were forced to retreat it was thus that on wednesday october twenty one we received the alarming news that the town would probably be bombarded in the evening 
we had already prepared our parcels in case we should be obliged to fly and now we were advised to live in our cellars which were pronounced quite safe against any danger of shells or bombs but our dear lady abbess how should we get her down to the cellar when it was only with great difficulty that she could move from one room to another if we were suddenly forced to leave what then would she do we could only leave the matter in god's hands we carried down a carpet bed armchair and other things to try to make matters as comfortable as possible for her then our own bedding and provisions the precious treasures and antiquities had already been placed in security and we now hastened to collect the remaining books and statues which we hoped to save from the invaders we had also been advised to pile up sand and earth against the cellar windows to deaden the force of the shells should they come in our direction but if this were the case they would first encounter the provision of petrol in the garden and then we should all be burnt alive to prepare for this alarming contingency dame theresa and dame bernard armed with spades proceeded to the far end of the garden where they dug an immense hole at the same time carrying the earth to block the entrances to the different cellars after a whole day's hard labour they succeeded in finishing their excavation and in tilting the huge barrel which they could neither roll nor drag it being both too full and too heavy to the place prepared their labour however proved all in vain for edmund displeased at the barrel's disappearance then highly amused at the brilliant enterprise declared he could not draw the petrol unless put back in its old position the reported fortunate arrival of a large number of indian troops they said four hundred thousand though forty thousand would be nearer the mark had a reassuring effect but we still remained in suspense for if the allies came by thousands the germans had a million men in the neighbourhood the allies and germans also sustained frightful losses the ambulance cars continually brought in the unfortunate victims from the battlefield till at last the town was full to overflowing one sunday morning a french officer and military doctor came to visit the convent to see if it would not be possible to place their wounded with us we willingly offered our services and mother prioress showing them the classrooms it was decided that the whole wing facing the ramparts including the classrooms children's dormitory and refectory the library novice ship and workroom should be emptied and placed at their disposal the great drawback was the lack of bedding for already before the arrival of the germans in the town we had given all we could possibly spare for the belgian wounded who had at that time been transported to ypres the two gentlemen took their leave very pleased with their visit the officer who seemed to all appearances a fervent catholic promising to send round word in the afternoon when all should be decided despite the fact that it was sunday we listened after having obtained permission to the proverb many hands make light work and soon the rooms in question were emptied of all that would not serve for the soldiers and were all ready for their use what was our disappointment in the afternoon to hear that the french officer thanking us profusely for our offer had found another place which was more suitable as being nearer the site of the engagement we had always shown our good will and were only too pleased to help in any little way the brave soldiers who daily nay hourly watered with their blood belgium's unfortunate soil this was not the last we heard of the officer for we soon had a visit from a french deacon who was serving as infirmarium in the ambulance begging for bandages for the wounded soldiers all our recreations and free moments were spent in rolling bandages for which were sacrificed sheets and veils and in fact anything that could serve for the purpose to all of which we of course added dozens of badges of the sacred heart the deacon was overjoyed and returned several times to beg giving us news of the fighting one day he brought a little souvenir by way of thanks for our help it consisted of a prayer book found on a german wounded prisoner who had died 
the prayers were really beautiful being taken mostly from passages of the psalms adapted for the time of war while the soiled leaves showed that the book had been well read one afternoon about this time the sister who acted as portress announced the visit of an english catholic priest serving as army chaplain mother prioress went immediately round to the parlour to receive the reverend visitor who stated that he had been charged by a well-known english lord should he ever pass by ypres to come to our convent to see the english flag which one of his ancestors had sent to the abbey mother prioress assured him that the only flag in the convent was the famous one captured by the irish brigade in the service of france at the battle of Ramillas. she added that she would be happy to give him a photograph of the flag he said he would be enchanted promising to call the next day to fetch it accordingly the following day he returned accompanied by two officers dame josephine together with dame teresa and dame patrick were sent to entertain them on entering the parlour dame josephine immediately knelt to receive the priest's blessing who looked rather put out at this unwanted respect after an interesting conversation on various topics she asked how long he had been attached to the army he said he had volunteered as chaplain being in reality a monk having also charge of a community of nuns more and more interested at not only finding a priest but a monk dame josephine expressed her admiration of the sacrifice he must have made in thus leaving his monastery and as to what order he belonged the reverend gentleman said he was of the order of st john the evangelist and that he was indeed longing to be able to put on once more his holy habit then making a sign to the officers he abruptly finished the conversation stating that he had an appointment which he could by no means miss and quickly vanished out of the parlour dame teresa and dame patrick who had hardly been able to keep in their laughter now told dame josephine of her mistake for they had truthfully divined that the supposed priest was a protestant clergyman in fact he had stated on his introduction that he was a priest of the church of england from which dame josephine had inferred that he was an english catholic priest and so her special attention to him dame teresa and dame patrick had rightly interpreted the visitor's description of himself as a protestant clergyman and enjoyed dame josephine's mistake outside the noise grew ever louder the roar of the cannon the rolling of the carriages paris omnibuses provision and ambulance cars the continual passage of cavalry and foot soldiers and the motor cars passing with lightning-like speed made the quiet sleepy little town of ypres as animated as london's busiest streets at night even the allied regiments poured in profiting by the obscurity to hide their movements from the germans while contrasting with the darkness the fire from the battlefield showed up clearly against the midnight sky one evening as we made our usual silent visit to the garrets before going to bed a signal of alarm announced that something more than ordinary had occurred in the distance thick clouds of smoke rose higher and higher which from time to time rolling back their dense masses showed sheets of fire and flame were the germans trying to set fire to the town no one was near to enlighten us so anxious and uneasy we retired to our cells begging earnest help from heaven since the first warning of bombardment one or other of us stopped up at night being relieved after some hours in case anything should happen while the community took their rest the most alarming news continued to pour in the soldiers by means of their telescopes had descried two german aeroplanes throwing down petrol to set the country and villages on fire were we to expect the same fate stories of german atrocities reached us from all quarters but what moved us most was the account of the outrageous barbarities used upon women even upon nuns we were far from an end of our troubles despite the danger and anxiety we strove to keep up religious life and the regular observances went on at the usual hours instead of distracting us the roar of the battle only made us lift up our hearts with more fervour to god 
and it was with all the ardor of our souls that we repeated at each succeeding hour of the divine office deus in agitorium meum intende domine ad adjuventendum me festina the liturgy of the holy mass also one would have said it had been composed especially for the moment on wednesday october twenty eighth between one thirty and two p m the hour for our pious meditation we were suddenly interrupted by a noise to which we were not as yet accustomed it seemed at first to be only a cannon-ball flying off on its deadly errand but instead of growing feebler as the shells sped away towards the german ranks the sound and whirr of this new messenger of death grew ever louder and more rapid till it seemed in its frightful rush to be coming straight on our doomed heads instinctively some flew to the little chapel of our blessed lady at one end of the garden others remained still where they were not daring to move till after a few seconds which seemed interminable a deafening explosion told us that something dreadful alas we knew not what must have occurred we learned afterwards that it was the first of the bombs with which the enemy infuriated at the resistance of what they disdainfully styled a handful of british soldiers determined to destroy the town which they already feared they would never retake the first bombs however did no damage the one which had so frightened us falling into the moat which surrounds ypres behind the church of st james and two others just outside the town at about nine thirty p m when we were retiring to our cells after matins another sound far from musical fell on our ears as usual some sped silently to the garrets where though hearing strange noises they could see nothing so every one went to rest concluding it was the sound of bombs again in fact the germans were bombarding the town we heard the next day that several houses in the rue notre dame had been struck and all the windows in the street broken the owners innocently sent for the glazier to have the panes of glass repaired little thinking that in a few weeks scarce one window would remain in the whole of ypres not content with fighting on the ground it seemed as though the sky also would soon form a second battlefield aeroplanes passed at regular hours from the town to the place of encounter to bring back news to the headquarters how the battle was waging besides this german taubes made their appearance waiting to seize their opportunity to renew with more success than their first attempt the disastrous ruin caused by the bombs it was high time to think of our dear abbess's safety it was therefore decided that she should take refuge at poporingi and mother prioress sent out for a carriage to convey her there but in the general panic which reigned every possible means of conveyance had been seized after several inquiries a cab was at last secured and soon drove up to the convent our dear lady was so moved when the news was broken to her that four of us were obliged to carry her downstairs after a little rest we helped her to the carriage which had driven round into the garden to avoid the inconveniences which would necessarily have arisen had the departure taken place in the street it proved almost impossible to get her into the carriage owing to her inability to help herself at length thanks to the assistance of one of the sisters of providence who had been more than devoted to her ever since her stroke we succeeded and accompanied by dame josephine a jubilarian dame placid and sister magdalen our beloved abbess drove out of the enclosure the great door soon hiding her from our sight sad troubled and anxious we turned back wondering what would become of our dear absent ones would they arrive safely at their destination would they find kind faces and warm hearts to welcome them only the boom of the guns mockingly answered our silent inquiries note to chapter three the flag at ypres by r barry o'brien there is a legend of a blue flag said to have been carried or captured by the irish brigade at the battle of ramilla and which was subsequently deposited in the irish convent at ypres this is a sceptical age people do not believe unless they see 
and i wish to submit this blue flag to the test of ocular demonstration accordingly in the autumn of nineteen o seven i paid a visit to the old flemish town now so familiar to us all in its misfortunes i was hospitably received by the kind and cheerful nuns who answered all my questions about the flag and the convent with alacrity can i see the flag oh, certainly and the flag was sent for it turned out not to be a blue flag at all blue was only part of a flag which it would seem had been originally blue red and yellow an aged irish nun described the flag as she had first seen it it was attached to a stick and i remember reading on a slip of paper which was on the flag remerciement refugié à ypres seventeen o the flag consisted of three parts blue with a harp red with three lions and yellow the red and yellow parts were accidentally destroyed and all that remains is the blue as you see it with a harp and we have also preserved one of the lions the story that has come down to us is that it was left here after the battle of ramilla i think but whether it was the flag of the irish brigade or an english flag captured by them at the battle i do not know the flag of course blue with a harp red with three lions and yellow suggests the royal standard of england with a difference at the time of the battle of ramilla the royal standard or king's colour consisted of four quarterings the first and fourth quarters were subdivided the three lions of england being in one half the lion of scotland in the other the fleur-de-lis were in the second quarter the irish harp was in the third but this uh, the ypres flag had when the nun saw it only three quarters blue with harp red with three lions and yellow the rest had then been apparently destroyed at the famous battle of seventeen o six the irish brigade was posted in the village of ramilla they fought with characteristic valour giving way only when the french were beaten in another part of the field the brigade was commanded by lord clare who was mortally wounded in the fight charles foreman writes in a letter published in seventeen thirty five at ramilla we see clare's regiment shining with trophies and covered with laurels even in the midst of a discomfited routed army they had to do with a regiment which i assure you was neither dutch nor german and their courage precipitated them so far in pursuit of their enemy that they found themselves engaged at last in the throng of our army where they braved their fate with incredible resolution if you are desirous to know what regiment it was they engaged that day the colours in the cloister of the irish nuns at ypres which i thought had been taken by another irish regiment will satisfy your curiosity mr matthew o'connor in his military memoirs of the irish nation says lord clare cut his way through the enemy's battalions bearing down their infantry with matchless intrepidity in the heroic effort to save his corps he was mortally wounded and many of his best officers were killed his lieutenant colonel murrah o'brien on this occasion evinced heroism worthy of the name of o'brien assuming the command and leading on his men with fixed bayonets he bore down and broke through the enemy's ranks took two pair of colours from the enemy and joined the rear of the french retreat on the heights of st andre foreman does not state to what regiment the colours belonged o'callaghan in his history of the irish brigade quotes him as saying i could be much more particular in relating this action but some reasons oblige me in prudence to say no more of it o'connor says that the colours belonged to a celebrated english regiment o'callaghan is more precise he says according to captain peter drake of drakereth county of meath who was at the battle with villeroy's army in de courier's regiment lord clare engaged with a scotch regiment in the dutch service between whom there was a great slaughter that nobleman having lost two hundred and eighty nine private sentinels twenty two commissioned officers and fourteen sergeants yet they not only saved their colours but gained a pair from the enemy this scotch regiment in the dutch service was by my french account almost entirely destroyed and by the same account clares engaged with equal honour the english regiment of churchill or that of the duke of marlborough's brother 
lieutenant general charles churchill and then commanded by its colonel's son lieutenant colonel charles churchill this fine corps at present the third regiment of foot or the buffs signalized itself very much in the action with another or lord mordaunt's by driving three french regiments into a morass where most of them were either destroyed or taken prisoners but the regiment anglois de churchill according to the french narrative fared very differently in encountering the regiment of clare by which its colours were captured as well as those of the regiment hollandois or scotch regiment in the dutch service the question may or may not be problematical but it seems to me that what i saw in the convent of ypres was a remnant of one of the flags captured according to the authorities i have quoted by the irish brigade at the battle of ramilla and that flag was apparently the king's colour which reproduces the royal standard end of note end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Irish Nuns at Ypres by Dame Mary Columban. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four in the Cellars. We were soon recalled from our reflections. For Mother Prioress, emerging from the parlor, announced to us that we were to have visitors that night. Two priests and five ladies had begged to be allowed to come to sleep in our cellars as news had been brought that the germans might penetrate into the town that very evening one could not refuse at such a moment though the idea was a novel one enclosed nuns taking in strangers for the night but in the face of such imminent peril and in a case of life or death there was no room for hesitation so to work we set preparing one cellar for the priests and another for the ladies in the midst of dragging down carpets, armchairs, mattresses, the news soon spread that there was word from Paparini. We all crowded around Mother Prioress in the cellar, where, by the light of a little lamp, she endeavoured in vain to decipher a letter which Dame Placid had hurriedly scribbled in pencil before the driver left to return to Ypres. The picture was worth painting. Potatoes on one side, mattresses and borders on the other, a carpet half unrolled each of us trying to peep over the other's shoulder and to come as near as possible to catch every word but alas these latter were few in number and not reassuring we can only get one room for lady abbess everything full up we are standing shivering in the rain please send blank then followed a list of things which were wanting poor lady abbess poor dame josephine what was to be done mother prioress consoled us by telling us she would send the carriage back the first thing next morning to see how every one was and to take all that was required we then finished off our work as quickly as possible and retired to our own cellar to say compline and matins for it was already ten o'clock after this we lay down on our straw sacks no one undressed even our uh, refugees had brought their packages with them in case we should have to fly during the night contrary to all expectations everything remained quiet even the guns seemed to sleep was it a good or evil omen time would show at five o'clock next morning the alarm clock aroused the community instead of the well-known sound of the bell there was no need either of the accustomed domine labia me asperius at each cell door at five thirty we repaired to the choir as usual for meditation and at six recited lauds prime and terse at seven the conventual mass began when as though they had heard the long silent bell the guns growled out like some caged lion angry at being disturbed from its night's rest the signal given the battle waged fiercer than before and the rattling windows together with the noise resounded through the church and choir told that the silence of the night had been the result of some tactics of the germans who had repulsed the allies day of desolation greater than we had before experienced 
not because the enemy was nearer not because we were in more danger but because at the end of holy mass we found ourselves deprived of what up till then had been our sole consolation in our anguish and woe the sacred species had been consumed the tabernacle was empty the sanctuary lamp was extinguished the fear of desecration had prompted this measure of prudence and henceforth our daily communion would be the only source of consolation from which we should have to deprive the courage and strength we so much needed the germans nearer meant greater danger so with still more ardour we set to work especially as we were now still more reduced in numbers the question suddenly arose who was to prepare the dinner our cook as has already been said had been one of the three german sisters who had left us on september eighth subsequently sister magdalen had replaced her and she too now was gone after mature deliberation dame columban was named to fulfil that important function but another puzzle presented itself what were we to eat for weeks no one had seen an egg now no milk could be got fish was out of the question there was no one left to fish to complete the misery no bread arrived for our baker had left the town nothing remained but to make some small loaves of meal and whatever else we could manage with potatoes oatmeal rice and butter of which the supply was still ample adding apples and pears in abundance edmund was sent out to see if he could find anything in the town he returned with four packets of quaker oats saying that that was all he could find but that we could still have a hundred salted herrings if we wished to send for them we had just begun the cooking when the tinkling of the little bell called every one together only to hear that a german taub was sailing just over the abbey so we were all ordered down to the cellars but before we reached them there was a crack crack bang bang and the rifle shots flew up from the street outside the convent to salute the unwelcome visitor but to no purpose and soon the sinister whistling whirr of a descending projectile grated on our ears while with a loud crash the bomb fell on some unfortunate building we had at first been rather amused at this strange descent to our modern catacombs but we soon changed our mirth to prayer and aspiration followed aspiration till the ceasing of the firing told us that the enemy was gone we then emerged from the darkness for we had hidden in the excavation under the steps leading up to the entrance of the monastery as the surest place of refuge there being no windows this was repeated five or six times a day so we brought some work to the cellars to occupy us the firing having begun next morning before breakfast was well finished one sister arrived down with tea and bread and butter later on while we were preparing some biscuits the firing started again so we brought down the mixing bowl ingredients and all we continued our work and prayers and paid no more attention to the bombs or the rifle shots our dear lady abbess was not forgotten the next day mother prioress sent for the carriage while we all breathed a fervent deo gracias that our aged abbess was out of danger for what could she have done in the midst of all the bombs owing to the panic which was now at its height all the inhabitants who were able were leaving the town abandoning their houses property all all anxious only to save their lives there was no means of finding a carriage our life by this time had become still more like that of the christians of the first era of the church our cellars taking the place of the catacombs to which they bore some resemblance we recited the divine office in the provision cellar under the kitchen which we had first intended for lady abbess a crucifix and statue of our lady replaced the altar on the left were huge wooden cases filled with potatoes and one small one of turnips on the right a cistern of water with a great block for cutting meat we had carefully hidden the hatchet in case the germans seeing the two together should be inspired to chop off our heads 
Behind us, other cases were filled with boxes and sundry things, whilst on top of them were the bread bins. We were, however, too much taken up with the danger we were in to be distracted by our surroundings. We realized then to the full the weakness of man's feeble efforts, and how true it is that God alone is able to protect those who put their trust in Him. The cellar adjoining, leading up to the kitchen, was designed for the refectory. In it were the butter tubs, the big meat safe, the now empty jars for the milk. A long narrow table was placed down the centre, with our serviettes, knives, spoons, and forks, while every one tried to take as little space as possible, so as to leave room for her neighbour. The procession to dinner and supper was rather longer than usual, leading from the antiquire through the kitchen, scullery, down the cellar stairs, and it was no light work carrying down all the portions, continually running up and down the steps, with the evident danger of arriving at the bottom quicker than one wanted to, sending plates and dishes in advance. Time was passing away. We now had to strip the altar to put away the throne and tabernacle. Someone suggested placing the tabernacle in the ground, using a very large iron boiler to keep out the damp, and thus prevent it from being spoilt. This plan, however, did not succeed, as will be seen. Dame Teresa and Dame Bernard flew off to enlarge the pit they had already begun, watching all the time for any taub which might, by chance, drop a bomb on their heads and indeed more than once they were obliged to take refuge in the abbey strange to say these things took place on sunday the feast of all saints it was rather hard work for a holiday of obligation but we obtained the necessary authorization towards evening the whole was finished and the boiler placed in readiness but how lift the throne which took four men to carry as far as the inner sacristy First we thought of getting some workmen, but were any still in the town? No, we must do it ourselves. So, climbing up, we gradually managed to slip the throne off the tabernacle, having taken out the altar stone. We then got down, and whether the angels, spreading their wings underneath, took part of the weight away or not, we carried it quite easily to the choir, where, resting it on the floor, we enveloped the whole in a blanket, which we covered again with a sheet. The tabernacle was next taken in the same manner, and reciting the adoremos, laudate, adoro te, we passed with our precious load through the cloisters into the garden. It was a lovely moonlit night, and our little procession, winding its way through the garden paths, reminded us of the Levites carrying away the tabernacle when attacked by the Philistines. We soon came to the place where the two royal engineers, for so they had styled themselves, Dame Teresa and Dame Bernard, were putting all their strength into breaking an iron bar in two, a task which they were forced to abandon we reverently placed our burden on the edge of the cauldron but found it was too small almost pleased at the failure we once more shouldered the tabernacle raising our eyes instinctively to the dark blue sky where the pale autumn moon shone so brightly and the cry of pulcra ut luna escaped from our lips as our hearts invoked the aid of her who was truly the tabernacle of the most high as we gazed upwards where the first bright stars glittered among the small fleecy clouds wondering at the contrast of the quiet beauty of the heavens and the bloodshed and carnage on earth a strange cloud unlike its smaller brethren passed slowly on it attracted our attention in all probability it was formed by some german shell which had burst in the air and produced the vapour and smoke which as we looked passed gradually away. We then reformed our procession and deposited the tabernacle in the chapter house for the night. Needless to say, it takes less time to relate all this than it did to do it, and numerous were the cuts, blows, scrapes, and scratches which we received during those hours of true hard labor. But we were in time of war, and war meant suffering, so we paid no attention to our bruises. 
our fruitless inquiries for a means to get news of lady abbess were at last crowned with success elaine the poor girl of whom mention has been already made and who now received food and help from the monastery came on sunday afternoon to say that two of her brothers had offered to walk to poporinghe next day and would take whatever we wished to send after matins mother prioress made up two big parcels putting in all that she could possibly think of which might give pleasure to the absent ones the next day was spent in expectation of the news we should hear when the young men returned breakfast was not yet finished when the portress came in with a tale of woe one of our workmen was in the parlour begging for help during the night a bomb had been thrown on the house next to his and he was so terrified that not daring to remain in his own house any more he had come with his wife and four little children to ask lodging in our cellars for a moment reverend mother hesitated but her kind heart was too moved to refuse and so the whole family went down into the cellar underneath the classroom which was separated from the rest and there remained as happy as could be we were soon to feel the truth of the saying of the gospel what you give to the least of my little ones you give it unto me in the afternoon we heard that the cab driver who had been to the convent on friday had spread the news that he had been ordered to poporinghe the next day to bring back the lady abbess and nuns what had happened could they not remain in their lodgings did they think that the bombardment had stopped just when it was raging more fiercely than ever when every day we thought we would be obliged to flee ourselves they must be stopped but how elaine who was again sent for came announcing her two brothers return mother prioress asked if it would be too much for them to go back to boboringe to stop lady abbess from returning they however declared they would never undertake it again the danger being too great and it being impossible to advance among the soldiers mother prioress then determined to go herself asking helene if she would be afraid to go with her to show the way helene bravely replied that she was not afraid and would willingly accompany mother prioress as usual mother prioress would allow none of us to endanger our lives she would go herself and on foot as the price demanded for the only carriage available was no less than forty francs in vain we begged her to let one of us go it was to no purpose and on tuesday morning she started off accompanied by helene leaving the community in a state of anxiety impossible to describe would she be able to walk so far we asked ourselves what if a bomb or shell were to burst on the road would she not probably miss lady abbess carriage we were now truly orphans deprived both of our abbess and our prioress and not knowing what might happen to either of them after an earnest sub tuum and angeli archangeli we went about our different tasks for we had promised reverend mother to be doubly fervent in her absence at eleven o'clock we said the office and afterwards sat down to dinner for which no one felt the least inclined the latter was not yet finished when there was a ring at the doorbell and in a few moments our prioress stood before us we could hardly believe our eyes she then related her adventures which for more accuracy i give from her own notes when i heard the door shutting behind me and the key turning in the lock in spite of all my efforts the tears came to my eyes i was then really out of the enclosure back again in the world after twenty-seven years spent in peaceful solitude the very sight of the steps brought back the memory of the day when i mounted them to enter the monastery i hesitated there was still only the door between us but no my duty lay before me i must prevent lady abbess returning so taking courage i started off with elaine who was trying all she could to console me i followed her blindly as we advanced the traffic increased more and more motor-cars cavalry foot soldiers cyclists passed in rapid succession on the pavement crowds of fugitives blocked the passage 
old and young rich and poor alike were flying taking only a few small packets with them their only possessions mothers distracted with grief led their little ones by the hand while the children chattered away little knowing the misery which perhaps awaited them and the soldiers they never ceased the allies in their different uniforms passed and repassed in one continued stream while the motor cars and bicycles deftly wended their way between soldiers and civilians i was stupefied and thought at every moment we should be run over but my companion amused at my astonishment assured me there was nothing to fear we had called on the burgomaster for our passports but he was absent and we had been obliged to go to the town hall after that i called on monsieur le principal du collège episcopal our chaplain to state that it was impossible to obtain a carriage as i had arranged with him that morning owing to our poverty and that i should therefore be obliged to go on foot he approved of our undertaking and even advised me to take the whole community straight away to poporinghe i told him i must first prevent lady abbess from coming back but that once at poporinghe i intended certainly to look out for a convent which would receive us all the british ambulance was established in the college and it seemed really like barracks once in the street again i heard click clack the british soldiers were shooting at a german taube passing over the town we hastened on many houses were already empty nearly all the shops were closed here and there a heap of ruins showed where a shell had made its way while out of the broken windows the curtains blowing in the wind showed the remains of what had once been sumptuous apartments we soon left the station behind us and continued on the main road with here and there a few houses which seemed more safe by being out of the town yet some of them had also been struck the regiments filled the road more numerously than ever while the unfortunate fugitives with a look of terror on their pale faces fled from the doomed city some who had left days before were venturing back again in the hope of finding their homes still untouched we continued our way stopped now and then by some unfortunate creature asking where we were going and relating in return his story of woe suddenly i heard myself called by name dame mara yes it is really she and at the same moment marie tack an old pupil flew into my arms her brother who accompanied her now came forward and took great interest in everything concerning the convent well he said we are benefactors of the carmelites at poporinghe my brother even gave them their house say that it is i who have sent you and you will surely be well received i thanked him for his kindness and we parted they returning to ypres where they had not dared to sleep in my heart i sent a grateful aspiration towards the divine providence of god which thus gave me this little ray of hope meanwhile the parcels we were carrying began to weigh more and more heavily on us we helped each other as best we could as i saw that poor elaine was almost out of breath having taken the heaviest for herself the roads also were very bad and we could hardly advance owing to the mud at length after walking two hours we saw the steeple of vlamaringi in the distance it was time for i felt i could not go farther i remembered that louis ve another old pupil lived at vlamerting though i had forgotten the address i asked several people in the streets if they could direct me but i received always the same answer i am sorry not to be able to oblige you sister i am a stranger i come from ypres from roulet from zonnebeek at last i ventured to ring at the door of one of the houses it happened to be the very one i was looking for louise who was at the ambulance came running to meet me with mariette and germaine tibergain and marie paul van der Vich. the latter told me that the church of their village langemark was burnt and she feared that their house which was close by would have met with the same fate at this moment her sister claire who had remained with the wounded soldiers came running in crying out lady abbess is here and dame josephine 
where i exclaimed instead of answering she took me by the hand and we both ran out to where a cab was standing i flew to the door and was soon in lady abbess's arms i could hardly restrain my tears how was it then that the carriage was on its way from poporigny to ypres had stopped just in front of the vase house when neither the driver nor any one else knew to whom it belonged or still less that i was there once again divine providence had come to our help otherwise we should have missed each other the cabman who had innocently been the means of our happy meeting by stopping to get refreshments now appeared i explained that it was an act of the greatest imprudence to conduct lady abbas to ypres but he would listen to nothing meaning to go he declared the danger was far greater at Perperinghe, and then drove away with mother abbas to ypres leaving me in consternation mariette and germain tibergain offered me their carriage to return to ypres it was soon ready and we started back once more Halfway to Ypres we saw the other cab again stationary, and a British officer talking to the nuns through the window. We called out to our coachman to stop, knocking at the windows with might and main. All was useless. The noise of the innumerable horses, provision, and ammunition carts passing deafened him, and he continued peacefully, quite unaware that anything had happened when we arrived at ypres the germans were shelling it in real earnest i wished to go back again to stop lady abbas at any price but was not allowed they said no one would be permitted to come into the town and that the other cab would probably have been sent back this day was not to pass without another surprise for what was our astonishment at about eight o'clock to see dame placid once more in our midst the officer whom mother prioress had seen talking through the carriage window had said that on no account could lady abbas think of going on to ypres which was actually being bombarded the cab had thereupon gone back to poporinghe but dame placid had alighted and come to ypres on foot we crowded around her to get news of all that had happened during the last four days which seemed like four weeks after we had related all that had passed in the monastery since her departure, Dame Placid told us in return what she had gone through. On the Friday afternoon, when our poor refugees had driven to Poporinghe, they went straight to the Benedictine convent, making sure they would be received without any difficulty. But alas, the monastery was full of soldiers, and no less than fifty other fugitives were waiting at the door from there they drove to the sueur poulain where also every corner was taken up then they went on to a private house but always with the same result until at last some one directed them to la sante union where they found a lodging it had been pouring rain the whole time and they were all cramped and cold poor lady abbess missed so much the little comforts she had had at the abbey and finally resolved to return to ypres with the result we know what could we now do to help her it was decided that sister romana would go back with dame placid to see if she could not be of use the two fugitives left at about four o'clock pushing before them a kind of bath chair filled with packets and parcels for lady abbess and the old nuns a rather strange equipment which was doomed never to reach its destination having with the greatest difficulty owing to the condition of the roads arrived at flamerting they were stopped by several regiments passing they waited 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 till at last an officer seeing their distress gave a signal and the soldiers halted to allow them to cross despairing of ever reaching poporinghe with their load they called at the house where mother prioress had been received that morning and begged to leave the little carriage and its contents there they then walked on more easily and were able to get to lady abbess before nightfall End of chapter four chapter five of the irish nuns at ypres by dame mary columban this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the bombardment to return to the abbey everything had become suddenly animated there 
for at the departure of dame placid and sister romana reverend mother prioress had declared that we should all follow taking advantage of the occasion as there was a sensation of hostilities for the moment in vain some of us begged to be allowed to remain behind but we had all to make our last preparations and go when however the packages turned up each bigger than the other we looked at one another in dismay how should we ever drag such a load with us dame columban and dame bernard offered to try to find a workman to help us and their offer was finally accepted what happened they record mother prioress gave us her blessing and led us out of the enclosure door oh dear what a sensation happy prisoners for so many years we now found ourselves in the streets with a shudder we started on our errand we had not gone a hundred paces when whiz bang a shell passed over our heads a moment after whiz bang another then another and another halfway down the street a british officer on horseback cried out to us messieurs à la maison where were we to go we knew no one we looked round to find a place of refuge and seeing a man standing on his doorstep timidly asked if we might take shelter there he willingly agreed seeming only too delighted to bid us welcome as soon as the officer had vanished we asked our kind host if he could tell us where the workman Shinchimaya, we were seeking lived and on being directed to his abode we left the house once more in the street we hurried on while crossing the grand place a perfect hail of shells and shrapnel came down on all sides explosion followed explosion the soldiers and civilians crouched down by the side of the houses whenever a shell burst but we ignorant of the great risk we were running walked bravely on at length we concluded we must have taken a wrong turning so meeting a pale-faced gentleman we asked him if he would be so kind as to put us on the right road again he was hurrying along burdened with parcels of all sizes and carrying a jug of milk when we spoke to him he seemed almost dazed uh, yes sisters he answered uh, certainly but but the germans have just shelled my house i'm running to save my life we understood then why he looked so disturbed offering our deepest sympathy we begged him not to trouble recovering himself he assured us that he was going our way and would willingly accompany us we took some of his parcels from him and went along at a turning in the street we parted having received further directions from him and thanked him for his kindness another man having overheard our conversation came forward and offered to conduct us to the house in question we went on passing several buildings which had been much injured and finally the bombardment raging all the time arrived at our destination only to hear that the workmen had left the town in the morning and had not been able to re-enter it the people in the house showed us the greatest kindness especially on hearing who we were and insisted on our spending the night in their cellar saying it was far too dangerous to go out again we thanked them for their offer but of course set off again for the monastery just as we arrived at the grand place elaine who had already rendered such valuable services to the community came running towards us she was breathless and almost crying having been searching for us everywhere we had been out so long and the bombardment had been so continuous that the nuns thought we must have been killed we soon got safely home where we found everyone in a dreadful state of anxiety on hearing the continued explosions mother prioress and the community had knelt down by the enclosure door to pray for the safe return of dame columban and dame bernard as they delayed so long reverend mother sent edmund to ask elaine to look for them having done so edmund returned and did his best to persuade the nuns that there was no need to leave the abbey you have your cellars to shelter you why do you want to go what will become of me when you are gone if bomb falls on the convent well it will be the will of god why not die here as well as anywhere else we shall see later that when the shell really did fall on the abbey the good man was anything but resigned to die 
as he perceived that he gained nothing by his eloquence he went out into the street and soon returned with a soldier to see if the newcomer might not be more successful the soldier was at first rather bewildered at his new surroundings being an english protestant but was soon set at ease on finding that we talked english at this moment the two wanderers came back and set every one's heart at ease of course there was no longer a question of our leaving that night especially as the soldier assured us that there was no danger that the germans would get into ypres adding that our cellars would be proof against all their bombs edmund by this time was triumphant and pulling out his cigar case offered it to the tommy who insisted on his accepting a cigarette in return edmund then began to relate the story of his woes what should i have to eat if they were to go he exclaimed imagine the other day the sister brought me my dinner what did i see i could hardly believe my eyes a piece of beefsteak i sat down in high glee for i do not remember when i had had a piece before what was my disappointment to find what i had taken to be a beefsteak was nothing else than a piece of fried brown bread i could have thrown it in the fire the soldier then took his leave though not before mother prioress had given him a badge of the sacred heart which he promised to wear always as a souvenir of his visit to our abbey we took care also to give him as many apples and pears as he could put into his pockets the number of people seeking shelter for the night in the convent increased constantly already some thirty persons had come some bringing their own mattresses the others depending on our charity we gave all that we had in the end no fewer than fifty-seven persons came for a night's lodging numerous poor came also during the day for food for they could not find anything to eat in the town bakers butchers grocers all had fled to save their lives we were in the greatest necessity ourselves but still gave to all who asked we experienced the truth of our lord's words give and you shall receive when a few days later we were in the streets without a house without food without money it was then indeed that we received a hundredfold the charity we showed toward those who applied to us in their distress on the wednesday morning our lord gave us a little surprise our chaplain had been obliged to leave ypres the evening before to place the nuns who lived in his college in safety but the divine master watched over us and instead of the one mass which he had lost he sent us two french military priests to offer up the holy sacrifice for us reverend mother presented her excuses for the poor breakfast they received for we had nothing to give them but the bread which we had made ourselves out of meal and some pears asking their opinion of the situation they strongly advised us to leave while there was yet time and inquired where we thought of going mother prioress told him that the lady abbess of oulton abbey in england had offered from the very outset of the war to take the whole community but the great question was how to get so far they said that we ought to apply to the british command for help expressing the opinion that the english ambulance established at the college of which our chaplain was the president would surely come to our assistance they then left saying how delightful it had been to have found such a peaceful spot in which to say mass after the noise and horrors to which they had been so long accustomed the day passed slowly the germans were gaining ground the noise of the allied guns was now deafening we were obliged to leave all the windows ajar to prevent the glass being broken by the shocks which made the house tremble from the garrets to the cellar monoplanes and biplanes friendly and hostile passed continually overhead the former chasing the latter which were dropping bombs without end on the town at last two friendly aeroplanes undertook to mount guard and remained continually hovering round and round but even then the taubes came and the fighting went on in the air as well as on all sides of us the risks of remaining were certainly great and yet why leave our abbey when it was still untouched we were sure of a warm welcome at oulton but how could the whole community get there and above all our beloved lady abbess on the other hand how were we to live in ypres 
not only were we in danger of being killed at any moment but there was no longer any means of getting food for several days edmund had with the greatest difficulty procured two pints of skimmed milk but even this would soon cease again there was certainly no more prospect of receiving any money in belgium where the banks had been robbed we had paid our debts prior to the commencement of hostilities and so had very little money left in the afternoon mother prioress determined to go out and seek for information at the british headquarters for every one seemed to have deserted the stricken town she took dame columban and dame patrick with her they went first to the college at the end of the rue st jacques a french soldier gave a military salute and advanced towards them it was one of the priests who had said mass for the community in the morning he accompanied the three nuns as far as the college but told them that the ambulance had left during the night which was a very bad sign for when the wounded were removed it showed that there was great danger he also promised to attend the next morning at five o'clock to say mass it was notified that the headquarters were to be found a mile and a half out of ypres the burgomaster had also left the town going to the houses of several influential people monsieur and madame la senateur fossi de van beck and madame van de burg and others friends of the monastery mother prioress and her companions found them all locked up and the inhabitants gone one big shop was burning and the french soldiers were trying to put the fire out a baker's establishment had a large hole in the roof it was pouring rain and the nuns had no umbrella so they turned their steps homewards but their mission was not to prove useless for divine providence had arranged that they were to help one of his poor creatures having arrived at the grand place they were stopped by an english officer who pointed to a cart driven by a soldier which was following them in it was an old woman lying apparently helpless he explained to them that passing by a deserted village which had been destroyed by the germans he had found her lying in a ditch he had lifted her into the cart and taken her along with him and he now asked if the nuns could not direct him to some hospital or institute where she would be taken care of they went with him as far as the hospice where the officials declared they had more work than they could possibly attend to still as mother prioress begged so hard they took her in the poor old woman was over ninety how many are there who like her find themselves turned out of the little home which had perhaps cost them their whole life savings why should the poor the aged the infirm the innocent suffer to satisfy the ambition of the unjust truly my ways are not your ways saith the lord in eternity lost in the blissful contemplation of god's infinite perfections we shall understand the wisdom of those things which now surpass our poor intelligence on thursday morning we arose at four thirty from what might truly be styled our humble couch to be ready for the promised mass at five o'clock during the night we had harbored the sisters of providence who were leaving next day having waited half an hour and no priest coming we recited lauds prime and tierce we again waited in all patience but no one appeared we could not miss holy mass and communion it was the only source of consolation left to us besides we never knew if perhaps we should live to see the following day the regiment to which the priest belonged had probably been ordered off during the night hence the reason of their non-arrival at seven thirty mother prioress assembled us all at the enclosure door and leaving edmund in charge of the convent we put down our veils and two by two started for the carmelite convent situated a little way down the street there we learned that the nuns had left the day before we were determined not to miss mass at any cost so continued as far as the church of st james where we arrived in the middle of one mass after which we received holy communion and then had the happiness of assisting at another mass celebrated also by a french chaplain though not one of those who had been at the abbey the day before on our way home we were met by a priest of the parish who had served mass for a long time in our chapel when he was a young boy and returning to ypres years after had always remained attached to the community he was touched to see us 
thus obliged to break our beloved enclosure and spoke words of courage and consolation to us the day passed in great anxiety relieved by one little incident which in spite of our perils and troubles afforded us amusement dame columban busy cooking in the kitchen found no dishes coming from the scullery where sister winifred now presided at the washing up she looked in asking when the things would be clean and found the sister bending over a tub of boiling water looking very tired and hot and received an answer that all would soon be finished some time passed but no dishes came being at a loss to know the cause of the delay she went once more to the scullery to inquire and found things in exactly the same state as before on asking what was wrong sister winifred exclaimed in a piteous tone of voice do you really think we are going this morning of course not who said so i don't know but i thought perhaps we might so in order not to have too much to carry i put on two habits two scapulars two petticoats and i do feel so hot if i may just go to our cell and change i think i'll get on better having as may easily be imagined obtained the permission she soon came joyfully back to her work we no longer believed the assurance the british soldiers gave us that we were quite safe and we now set to work to lighten our packages as much as possible only taking what was strictly necessary it being even decided that we should only take one breviary each and leave the other three behind there still remained a good deal to carry for we were to take some provisions not knowing if we should find refuge at poporinghe or if we should have to go straight to england it was absolutely necessary to find some means of carrying our packages were it but a wheelbarrow mother prioress now found a reward for her charity for the poor workman whom she had so kindly received with his family in the cellar hearing of our distress found a handcart and what was more promised to push it for us the next day friday we went out again to holy mass at st james having had very few people in the cellar for all those who could possibly leave the town had already done so when we returned mother prioress announced her decision to go to the headquarters and set off immediately accompanied by dame patrick without even taking her breakfast the rest of the community went about their different occupations until she should return nine o'clock struck half past nine ten half past ten still no mother prioress to say we were anxious but feebly expresses our state of mind the shells and bombs were flying in all directions and the explosions joined to the firing of the guns resembled some huge machinery with its never-ceasing boom and crash we prepared the dinner which consisted of salt herrings and fried potatoes but there was no account of the mother prioress as yet each ring at the door made us crowd round in joyful expectation but each time a disconsolate no was all the answer we received from the portress we recited sext and non but no mother prioress as yet we consulted together as to what should be done some thought reverend mother must have been kept others that she had perhaps found a motor-car and had seized the opportunity to go to poparinghe to see lady abbess the dinner was spoiling on the fire yet no one cared to sit down to eat the bell rang but we scarcely had the heart to answer it we had been disappointed so often we felt sure we should only hear another no suddenly a joyous ringing of the little handbell which had served alike to announce the divine office and to warn us of german taubes passing overhead brought every one to their feet and we soon crowded round our dear prioress to beg her blessing asking all together for an explanation of her long absence for greater surety we shall cite her own notes the headquarters had left the town we had therefore a long way to go in town there was never the same movement of troops but the aspect seemed still more mournful the shells had begun their work of destruction on the grand place a corner of the halls had been struck a house had received a bomb on the roof which penetrating the building carried away half of the front making its way through ceilings and floors throwing the furniture to right and left carrying chairs down into the very cellar the people standing around were looking on aghast 
we passed on but soon a poor woman stopped us and you sisters from where do you come we are the irish dames of st james street oh yes i know the convent well are you also leaving i am afraid we shall be obliged to do so and we continued our walk we had already turned off into another street when we heard hurried steps behind us and some one crying out sisters 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 it was the good woman again with her kind face her big handkerchief round her head and her blue flemish apron sister don't leave the town come home with me we are poor but still you can have my house and all i have good woman i said taking her two hands thank you a thousand times do not be anxious for us our lord will take care of us i could have kissed the dear creature then and there we could not stop soon a crowd blocked our passage a shell struck here last night they explained to us it was the circle catholique and penetrated into the cellar where a poor man had taken refuge with his three children thinking he would be more protected here than in his own home and there is his house just two buildings farther on untouched the man has his hand off two children are killed and the third a girl is dying by this time we had made our way through the crowd the fugitives were continually passing leaving homes and all behind at length we arrived at the residence of the staff officers we explained our case to one of them who received us very courteously and who told us the best thing to do would be to address ourselves to general sir douglas haig an orderly informed him that sir douglas had left for brelin the officer advised us to go there it was already eight thirty and we had still a good hour's walk before us the road resembled that to poparenge one must have seen the continual passage of troops motor cars horses fugitives in the narrow lanes the roads inches thick with mud to have a true idea of it here and there a house struck by a shell or bespattered with mud almost to the roof gave an indescribable air of sadness to the surroundings while a bouquet of flowers or an old bibelot discarded in a shop window remained as a sole souvenir of the joys and prosperity of our brave little belgium brelin now came in sight we stopped before the calvary erected at the entrance to the cemetery and then paid a visit to the church on coming out we met the cure of the village who interested himself in our trials and sorrows we then asked the way to the headquarters where we found it was impossible to see sir douglas his aide-de-camp gave us some rather vague information but kindly offered to get us seats in a motor-car that was leaving for poparenge it did not start however till midday and even then i could not go down without telling the community at ypres we set out on our way back to ypres just outside the village a poor woman all in tears stopped us showing us a big cavity which a shell had just made in the ground by her farm i should have been killed she exclaimed except for the brave english soldiers who seeing the shell coming in my direction had just the time to take me up and push me into the farm but my cow is gone our little farm was all our fortune and she wiped away the tears with the corner of her apron poor dear how many are there still more unfortunate than she as we approached the town the whistling shriek of the shells became more distinct the germans were bombarding ypres as hard as they could we found ourselves almost alone in the streets here and there a few soldiers remained in the doorways of the houses a shell flew straight over us what a protection of divine providence a few steps off a building was struck and we just escaped getting a shower of bricks and glass on top of us come to the other side dame patrick called out we crossed over murmuring aspirations all the time a little farther on another shell burst and the house we had just passed fell a heap of shapeless ruins we hastened our steps to get out of the street which seemed to be the chief point of attack we then breathed more freely till arrived at the grand place we were welcomed by a regular shower of shells which flew in all directions happily we had almost reached our destination though had it not been for dame patrick i should never have known my way but should probably have passed by the monastery 
at the door we met two brave britishers whom i told to come into the parlor where they would be more out of danger they did not feel afraid and said they were sent to search for some bread for they could not get any in the town i gave them some of the provisions which we were to take with us with a little pot of butter and what i knew they liked so much as many pears as they could carry they were delighted and so were we we then talked of the war and the old story came back again the hope so cherished by all and yet also not realized oh it will soon be over it will be home for christmas our poor dinner was now served the last we were to take in the dear old home the reading was made aloud as usual the subject was holy poverty truly appropriate for the times and surroundings the last words which the reader pronounced before the signal was given were the lord has given the lord has taken away may his holy name be blessed had we prepared the reading beforehand it could not have been better chosen our dear lord had truly given us our abbey and had made it withstand the course of years with all the changes of government wars and revolutions which had swept over belgium especially flanders and now he was taking it away may his holy name be blessed end of chapter five chapter six of the irish nuns at ypres by dame mary columban this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six flight during dinner the bombardment had been at its height in that short half hour almost twenty shells had burst quite close to us it was our side of the town that was being attacked already a poor woman begging for something to eat had told the portress that the roof of the college was struck mother prioress deaf to all entreaties said that every one without exception was to be ready at two o'clock we went about looking perhaps for the last time at the dear old scenes which we had thought to leave only when death should knock at our door we had already placed on every window of the convent a paper badge of the sacred heart and lastly erected a niche outside one of the garret windows in which we put the miraculous statue of our lady of the angels which had remained unhurt outside the monastery in the siege of ypres in seventeen forty four we had done all we could and must now abandon all leaving everything under the double protection of the mother and the son a little after two o'clock the hand-cart came round to the door all the packages could not fit in it in spite of reverend mother having made us take out nearly all we had gathered together for she had learnt by experience in carrying the things she had prepared for lady abbess as far as vlamerting three days before the difficulties of walking so far and carrying a heavy parcel at the same time the enclosure door was then fastened on the inside and all other important rooms or cupboards being likewise locked we passed with a last farewell through the long-loved choir which had known the joys and sorrows of our whole religious life we then went through the outer church into the sacristy locking the door of the grill behind us there was but one more door which separated us from the outside world one door more and we should be out of our enclosure perhaps never more to return there was a pause in our sad procession the key was not there our lord watched over us once more for had we then continued in our procession some of us would inevitably have been badly hurt if not indeed killed after a few minutes waiting the key was brought and already placed in the keyhole when a loud explosion accompanied by a terrific crash which shook the entire building laid us all prostrate bewildered rather than afraid we arose and saw through the window a shower of bricks and glass falling into the garden the first though not the last shell had struck our well-beloved abbey we now realized that there was no time to waste already edmund was screaming out from the other side of the still locked door why don't you come i told you you should have left long ago the convent is struck we shall all be killed if you don't make haste the door was opened and with an indescribable feeling of horror mingled with uncertainty we went out 
in the street we raised our eyes in one sad farewell to our beloved monastery and there out of the cell windows principally that of mother prioress a cloud of vapour and smoke told us of the passage of the shell while the remains of the garret windows overhead and other debris of slates bricks and glass strewn on the pavement proved without a doubt that divine providence had truly intervened in allowing the little delay in the sacristy but for which we should have been just on the spot when all this had happened a cry of anguish arose from our hearts as hurrying along the deserted street we saw our convent thus apparently burning halfway down the street another explosion behind us made us look around to see if the abbey had again been struck but no this time it was the institut st louis just in front turning the corner we saw some tommies scrambling out of a house which had also been shelled as we stumbled over the bricks which covered the road edmund hurrying us on for bare life one of the soldiers caught sight of us and calling out to another to come to help the sisters he threw down the bundle he was carrying and seizing two of ours he walked along with us his comrade doing the same we shall continue the narrative from the notes of dame patrick as we were nearing the rue de lille where the shells were falling thickly two soldiers came forward to help us with our packages we chatted as we hurried along stopping every one or two minutes to avoid a shower of bricks as we heard a shell hiss over our heads and fall on one of the houses by us one of us remarked to the soldiers it is very kind of you to help us to our delight they answered it is our same religion and our same country they were both irish catholics one from Kerry, the other from belfast when we reached the outskirts of the town they were both obliged to turn back not having leave to quit ypres the carry man left us hurriedly but our man from belfast ventured a little farther though in the end he thought it wiser to return to his regiment so we shook hands with him and thanked him heartily wishing him good luck and a safe return to dear old ireland our good mother prioress had a bag of pears in her hand so she said to him here take these pears and eat them and we will pray for you but he turned away and said no 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 keep them for yourselves here the poor fellow broke down and cried he hurried away waved his hand and wished us god speed i happened during this little scene just to have moved on thinking mother prioress was by me however on looking round i saw she was some distance behind so i walked back to join her to my surprise i found her weeping i felt very shaky myself but did not want to seem so i jokingly said oh mother prioress what is the matter then she told me what had happened and said i could keep up no longer when i saw that dear kind genuine irish-hearted man break down how i wish i could know his name come along i said let us hope that one day we shall find it out but don't cry any more or you'll have me joining in too i then thought on my brave tender-hearted countryman who had left home and country to serve in the british army as belgium's friends and protectors and i felt proud and happy that we irish benedictines should have fallen in so often with irishmen always meeting with the same kind-heartedness we had left the town in a terrible state through several streets which we passed we could not see the other side on account of the clouds of smoke and dust occasioned by the bursting of the shells and the falling buildings several telegraph posts lay across the road with the wires hopelessly twisted and broken soldiers were running to and fro propping up walls which had been shaken by an explosion in the vicinity or making for some new ruin to see if they could be of any use at last leaving the terrible sight behind us we passed by the rue d'avoding on to the road leading to poperinghe here we picked up the good fellow who was pushing the handcart he took some more packages tying them all together with a stout rope to prevent them falling off his wife and little children were also there for they dared not remain in the town how glad were we now that reverend mother had listened to our chaplain when he told her not to wait till the last moment to place dear lady abbess in safety 
what would she have done in the midst of those dreadful shells which although we had left the town far behind us still continued though we heard them not so loudly now to fly on their errand of destruction towards poor unfortunate ypres there is no need to describe the marching of the troops as they passed us on the way as mother prioress has already mentioned it in her notes what left the deepest impression on our memories was the thick slimy mire we had to wade through in some places it was so bad that it was almost impossible to get on we seemed to slide back two steps for every one that we made forward we trudged bravely on but before we had gone a quarter of the way some of us were already au bout we who for years had not walked more than six or seven times round our little garden were certainly little fitted to go some nine miles in that dreadful mud and carrying parcels which by this time seemed to weigh tons at last flemerding came in sight if only it had been poparingi we were not even quite halfway we could hardly push through the crowds of fugitives each with his or her bundles of different colour shape and size some men had four packages two in front and two behind slung over their shoulders others were bent in two with huge sacks on their backs others pushed wheelbarrows or perambulators in front of them while some were content with a little bundle tied up in a pocket handkerchief one respectable-looking man carefully hugged two umbrellas were they his only treasures we passed through the village and on 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 always in company of troops motor-cars and refugees the latter accosted us from time to time to ask who we were and where we came from they nearly all seemed to know the irshi van damen von st jacob's trot several officers and soldiers saluted us also as we passed if only the driver of some motor-car would have given us a lift but they flew past so quickly they probably did not even see us the mason's little children took turn by turn to have a ride on the hand-cart seated on the top of all the bundles while the others hung out of the poor mother's arms who cheered them on and told them wonderful tales in flemish one little boy was squeezing an almost imperceptible black puppy which he would not let go of for all the world while the young gentleman was having his turn for a ride there was a sudden halt on the way the wee doggie had managed to wriggle out of his master's tight embrace and making good use of his long side for liberty had fallen out of the cart luckily no bones were broken owing to the soft carpet of mud into which he sank indeed the poor cart was obliged to stop more than once either to make way for two regiments who were marching in different directions or for two or three motor-cars passing all at once and often enough getting literally stuck in the mud or to give a rest to edmund and the workmen who had a hard time of it it was now getting dark and a thick mist was rising the sound of the firing was getting more and more feeble as we left ypres farther and farther behind from time to time a dead horse stretched out in the ditch or in a field close by would make us turn away from the mournful sight we walked and walked would we never arrive at our destination it became darker at every moment we were obliged to keep well together for fear of being left behind the trees which lined the road loomed out as though they had been some unearthly spectres with their leafless branches like gaunt arms uplifted towards the sky to call down vengeance on the earth while magnified through the thick mist the moon tinged with red seemed to reflect the bloodshed and carnage of the battlefield at last we caught sight of a feeble glimmer which unlike the lights of the motor-cars as they sped along throwing an electric flash into our dazzled eyes and then vanishing leaving the darkness more intense grew brighter and brighter as we advanced could it really be pouring eh we hastened on almost forgetting our fatigue yes we were truly there it was pouring eh but where were we to turn our steps soon we were surrounded by a crowd soldiers and civilians men and women looked with commiseration on this new group of fugitives who added to the number of those who already filled the town reverend mother asked to be directed to the carmelites remembering the recommendation of mr tack 
two girls offered to conduct us there at this moment a gentleman came forward asking what we desired we only discovered later that it was the judge in a few words mother prioress explained the situation on hearing mention of la santa union where lady abbess had taken refuge he informed us it was quite close at hand that if we wished he would conduct us there first and in case there should be no room for us all he would undertake to find us lodgings needless to say we willingly accepted the proposal and in a few minutes we found ourselves in a cheery little parlour awaiting the superior's decision the permission was accorded at first rather hesitatingly and for one night only was it astonishing the poor nuns had just given up the school premises to the french ambulances they had also given refuge to a community from osnick who were afterwards joined by their sisters from passchendaele and now we arrived also however when they discovered that we really were what we made ourselves out to be and not german spies or vagrants and especially as during the conversation one of the elder nuns found that she had formerly been the mistress of mother prioress when she had been to the convent at hesbrook in preparation for her first communion the community having been expelled from france eleven years before they soon changed and for a whole fortnight showed us every kind of hospitality now dame placid and sister romana heard the news and came running down to welcome us then sister magdalen and poor dame josephine the meeting was a happy one which however soon changed to sadness when we related what had happened to the old abbey we were impatient to see our beloved lady abbess soon our dear prioress who had gone first to break the news gently reappeared and we all trooped upstairs little dreaming of the sad scene which that very little parlour would witness in less than a fortnight's time lady abbess was at once both anxious and pleased so after an exchange of greetings and having received her blessing we retired we now began to realise what we had done it was all so strange we were now truly poor not knowing what would befall us sacre coeur de jesus j'ai confiance en vous we were really and truly destitute of all human aid and depended solely on our loving father in heaven for everything soon the good nuns had prepared supper for us after which we made a visit to the church and then were not sorry to be shown the way to the dormitory it had belonged to the children who owing to the war had not returned after the holidays oh dear where were our cells here there were not even alcoves but some pretty-looking curtains covered two sides of each bed we were not even alone in the dormitory several beds being already occupied suddenly to our great surprise antoinette dune one of our old pupils who had always remained especially attached to mother prioress threw herself into reverend mother's arms saying that she also was stopping at la santa union with her two servants she was delighted at the idea of sharing the dormitory with her old mistresses truly the war brought about strange coincidences and made us meet with devoted friends when we least expected it soon we were reposing on a soft mattress and spring bed and unaccustomed to such luxury as well as worn out by the fatigues of the day we were not long in falling asleep End of chapter six chapter seven of the irish nuns at ypres by dame mary columban this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven visiting the wounded it was late the next morning when we awoke for there were no guns to disturb our slumbers however we were up in time for the last mass having breakfasted we set to work to carry our parcels upstairs and to clean our shoes which owing to our peregrinations were hardly recognizable being simply clotted with mire and dirt this finished we made our first visit to the wounded soldiers in the ambulance what a scene of suffering met our eyes if it made us realize more than ever that we had left our beloved enclosure still it gave us an insight into human misery which we should never have had 
had we remained peacefully in our abbey the ensemble was not yet organized only those downstairs having bedsteads the poor soldiers upstairs lying on straw on the floor the impression made was ineffaceable we now saw what war really meant and we left ever having distributed little cakes biscuits and sweets with a promise to come back as often as we could mother prioress was now called for to see edmund and the poor family who had not been received in the convent as the superioress had been threatened with a summons if she received any refugees they had been directed to the police station where having presented themselves they had been placed in an inn and had passed the night in an attic on some straw they were also starving having had nothing to eat they were quickly given some of our provisions and mother prioress paid the mason for his hard work of the day before being now a little consoled he said he would go off with his wife and children to a village close by to see if he would not be more successful in getting a lodging there edmund remained lamenting loudly over his misfortunes the chaplain of the community passing by and hearing his sad tale had compassion on the poor man and told him he might sleep at his house while the nuns arranged to give him his meals after some days however he found the priest's house too far away from the convent and so managed to get a bed at a baker's establishment just opposite every morning we had the happiness of assisting at two or four masses for besides the director of the community whose mass edmund served some french priests who were attached to the ambulance also requested permission to celebrate the holy sacrifice reverend mother arranged with the superioress that we might go to the chapel when we liked to say our office where instead of stalls turning the chairs to face each other we improvised a choir and recited the benedictine hours with the usual ceremonies we were of course obliged to advance the night office saying vespers and compline at two thirty and matins and lauds at four it being often necessary to bring the chairs close to the window to have light to finish if as it sometimes happened we were unable to keep to the given hours on sunday afternoon eleven nuns from the rue de lille at ypres came to beg refuge they were expelled french nuns of the sacred heart of jesus who had devoted themselves since the outbreak of the war in our parts to tending the wounded soldiers it was they who had had such a narrow escape when the germans came to ypres whilst they had their convent full of belgians they told us afterward how good their wounded had been and how the greater part as soon as they were well enough used to come to benediction and sing with the nuns now however they brought sad news from the town which was being bombarded worse than ever they had been obliged to fly for their lives one sister had been killed by a bomb a servant badly wounded and their superioress had stopped behind with two nuns compelling the others to leave they had at first taken the wrong road going straight to the scene of battle but being sent back by the british soldiers they had made their way as best they could to paparine they had lost six of their number not knowing what had become of them seventeen had left the convent and now only eleven had arrived at Poporinghe. the next day our servant man came round to say that he had received an invitation to go back to ypres the following day with another man who was willing to run the risk of returning needless to say we were delighted to have such a good chance of getting news about our monastery and all prayed for his safety we anxiously awaited the result of this venture hoping that he would be able to get into the convent and that above all no harm would happen to him true enough he came back in triumph dragging another huge parcel of things he had managed to secure for himself the dreadful account he gave of the monastery filled us with despair for according to his description half the building seemed to have been destroyed happily the person who had accompanied him called the next day and told us that edmund had greatly exaggerated the mischief done 
and he hoped that if the germans could be repulsed we should be able to return in four or five days mother prioress determined to ascertain the truth of the case for herself she accordingly made inquiries as to whether it would be possible to go to ypres in a motor-car Monsieur van der Meersch, a solicitor who lived near the abbey, came to our help, and an officer was found who was willing to take two nuns with him. We begged our dear prioress not to expose herself to such evident danger, but as usual she would not listen, and it was decided that Dame Placid should accompany her. God, who ever protects those who put their trust in him, arranged otherwise, and the motor-car was prevented from leaving Popolinghe. We heard afterwards that at the very time that they should have arrived, a bomb had fallen on another motor and killed five officers. During the next days, news poured in from Ypres. At one time we heard that the Germans had been repulsed, and their guns captured, and that Ypres would soon be quite safe again shortly afterwards it was announced that the enemy was mercilessly bombarding the town some houses were falling others burning we were more than ever convinced that we could believe nothing that we heard and must necessarily see for ourselves besides the guns which we had only heard feebly in the distance on our arrival at Perperinghe, could certainly be heard far more distinctly now were we going to be bombarded a second time it really seemed probable for german aeroplanes appeared in sight apparently scrutinizing the movements of the allies and had not that been the beginning of the hostilities at ypres in the streets the regiments passed and repassed the poor brave fellows marching off to the battle and the others coming back from the trenches to have a well-merited repose it was often touching to see how those who had not been ordered out would await the return of the troops anxiously scanning the lines as they passed and on perceiving a comrade perhaps a chum coming back unhurt they would run forward and have a handshake with a joyful greeting as the horses trotted by but alas there were always a number of empty saddles belonging to those who had been taken to the ambulance or were still left dead on the battlefield the horses themselves seemed mournful as they followed mechanically after the others as though they felt it must be partially their fault that their dear masters were no longer there often also numbers of german soldiers would march past between two files of british or french soldiers on their way to the station our poor wounded french soldiers were not forgotten by this time things were arranged better nearly all had beds now some even sheets and this was due to the unflagging devotion of three priests attached to the ambulance as infirmarians they certainly preached to us a silent sermon of self-forgetfulness and heroic charity and our greatest pleasure was to hear them relate all they had gone through since the war broke out in the french army alone forty thousand priests mixed with the common soldiers the greater number being combatants the brave wounded also gave us many a lesson never finding fault with anything never complaining of their dreadful wounds and yet how horribly some of them were mutilated a great number were obliged to have an arm or leg amputated one had his lower jaw carried away another his whole face from below the eyes most of them were wounded in the head which made them suffer dreadfully some even being delirious there were some who belonged to the highest aristocracy counts and barons were there lying on straw or hard stretchers others again were quite young only twenty or twenty-one yet all were patient all courageous all sure that in the end the allies would win and the germans be defeated the unfortunate victims who died of their wounds were carried out to a little hut or tent erected in the garden as we passed by we would lift up the curtain which hid them from view and say a de profundis for the repose of their souls sometimes as many as eleven or twelve lay there awaiting the coffins which could not be made quickly enough one poor zouave who had probably been dead some time before it was found out 
lay there with his arms uplifted as though he still held the gun with which he would even in death lay low his enemy but we cannot do better than take from the notes of dame theresa who was so devoted in visiting the ambulance at poparinghe we spent all our time making badges of the sacred heart for the wounded soldiers almost every day we went to visit them this gave us the greatest joy the first time we entered the large room number one where they lay some on beds others on stretchers we were struck with horror and pity there they were young men and middle-aged from every department of france some had been struck on the head others on the chest back or shoulder or else wounded in the legs and yet not one complaint escaped their lips only one poor fellow who was delirious called out as we passed by my head my head oh if you only knew what it is to have such a headache another soldier just twenty-one said to us in the patois of the south of france franche franche shall i ever see thee again we went from one room to another speaking to each and cheering them up we gave them pears and it used to be our greatest pleasure to peel them cut them in small bits and now and again we would put them in their mouths when they were unable to move they were as simple as children and loved our visits sister you'll come back to-morrow won't you it is so nice to see you it cheers us up i remember one incident which shows their simplicity dame valberga and i had been going round distributing small bits of pear which they much relished as very comforting to their parched lips but there came a time when we had exhausted our last pair and still many soldiers had not had a bit of course next day we would serve them the first but dame valberga whispered to tell me one poor fellow had been watching me so anxiously for some time i turned towards him to say a little word of comfort but he interrupted me saying in a fretful childish way oh sister and you have given me no pair and i wanted one so badly in vain we searched our pockets all the while promising he should be served the first next day he repeated oh it's to-night i wanted it we left the room sadly wishing for once in our religious lives that we had a penny to buy him a pair but almighty god who is all-powerful heard the prayer of his children for hardly had i told this story to one of the nuns of la santa union than she gave me a pair and though it was already dark we ran back joyfully to our poor wounded soldier who seemed dumb for joy but his happy face rewarded us beyond words the unselfishness of the soldiers toward each other was marvellous once while peeling a pear for a soldier one who was eating a piece of bread he said to me sister i am sure my neighbour would also like a piece i turned to the other who answered timidly oh yes i, I would like it but see sister I, I have a little bit of meat on my bread and he has none so give it to him needless to say i divided it between them sometimes they would give us a little money out of their purses to buy biscuits or cheese or as they said something to eat one zouave asked us to buy him a pair of socks at this french ambulance we also had the joy of making the acquaintance of three soldier priests who daily said mass at the convent thus giving us the happiness of sometimes hearing five masses a day i do not quite remember the names of the priests i think one was called m l'abbe tec and another m l'abbe coq of dijon and the third was m l'abbe louis jabenel of avignon this latter was very fond of benedictines and gave us a special blessing before leaving assuring us that we should immediately feel at home among our sisters at ulton these priests were more than devoted to the soldiers administering the last sacraments and bringing holy communion to them no matter at what time of the day the little badges of the sacred heart also did their work all the soldiers asked to have them and insisted on our pinning them ourselves to their clothes 
the priests wore them and distributed hundreds so that we could scarcely keep pace with their fervor except by working at them every free minute we had some of the infirmarians even asked to have a few to send away in their letters they wrought many conversions the soldiers all wanted to have them again there was dreadful news from ypres the hospital was entirely destroyed the british soldiers had gone with their motor-cars to take away the four nuns who still risked their lives by staying to tend the poor victims who were daily struck down in or about the town four other nuns had been killed in their cellar a priest carrying the holy oils to a dying person had been struck down in the street the germans had even made new bombs bigger and more destructive than those used before what should we do would it not be wiser to accept lady abbess of ulton's kind invitation and go straight on to england while there was yet time but our abbey why leave it if we could possibly return we found ourselves surrounded at Poparingi by every attention which charity could suggest and although the community of la sante union had often the greatest difficulty to provide for the increased number of fugitives there being two other communities as well as ourselves still we received everything that was possible in the circumstances however as the officer in charge of the ambulance demanded one thing after another for his soldiers he came at last to claim the room which had been placed at our disposal the superioress was obliged to yield and the chef soon established the supplies of food in what had been our refectory we were now forced to take possession of the nuns refectory going to our meals before or after theirs we thus found ourselves at table not only with the two other communities above mentioned but also with the servants of one of our old pupils who were also stopping in the convent to help at the ambulance we managed as best we could and still kept up our tradition of entering in procession saying the de profundis and then reciting the benedicting grace before and after meals this was not all there was a door at one end which led into the room given up to the soldiers consequently at any moment one would appear in the refectory to fetch a loaf of bread or some meat and so on and then repass again on his way out once when a priest came mother prioress gave him a pair as also to the soldiers who came after him but soon the superioress put up a large screen which enabled them to enter without disturbing the community they had a very hard life often we saw their shadows through the matte glass as they stood at the windows eating their dinners in the rain and snow and now our lord was preparing a cross which we had not counted on and which added to the grief that already weighed down our hearts our poor dear dame josephine already fifty-two years professed now left us feeble and infirm the shock had been too much for her the want of good nourishment had also told on her she was soon obliged to keep her bed having caught cold the doctor on seeing her declared the case dangerous and proposed that she should receive the last sacraments this took place on friday november thirteenth feast of all the saints of the benedictine order alas we little expected that another one would so soon increase their happy company saturday our dear patient seemed to rally a little and none of us believed the infirmarian when in the evening she told us she was dying however mother prioress remained some time alone with dame josephine helping her to renew her vows and offer up holy aspirations she herself did not think she was so bad but always ready to obey she followed the prayers suggested by her whom she had known when she had been sister mara a lively fervent eighteen-year-old postulant and whom she had always cared for as a mother now that her dearly beloved little novice had grown into her superioress she submitted herself with childlike simplicity asking her blessing morning and evening thus edifying greatly the whole community she therefore now made when dame mara proposed it 
her act of resignation should god demand the sacrifice of her life two of us offered to divide the night between us to watch by her bedside after one a m she slept a little though her breathing was difficult at two thirty she awoke and seemed rather restless before going down in the morning mother prioress paid dame josephine another visit but we could no longer distinguish what she said we replaced each other during the masses but about seven thirty every one was called out of church there being now no more doubt the superioress of the house knelt with mother prioress close by the bed and several nuns of both communities joined their prayers to ours during which our dearest jubilarian breathed forth her innocent soul it was the feast of the dedication of the churches our lord had chosen the day himself for had she not passed her whole religious life in the service of the altar as sacristan and by a curious coincidence in which we may again detect the loving attention of the divine master the burial settled at first for tuesday was put off till wednesday feast of the dedication of st peter and st paul sad at any time the loss of our dear dame josephine now appeared doubly so in exile and in the midst of so many other trials she had truly chosen the better part and we felt a sort of relief to know that she had been spared the horrors which we should in all probability live to see every one showed us the kindest sympathy in our loss dame aloysius and dame columban performed the last duties to the dear departed one and laid her out in the same little parlour where she had come to welcome us just nine days before on the evening of our arrival every one came to pray by her corpse all the nuns the chaplain even several of our old pupils who having taken refuge in poporenge heard of our sad loss and last of all poor old edmund who for a moment forgot his own troubles to grieve over dear dame josephine whom like every one else he had esteemed and respected each as they left the little room where such a peaceful silence reigned declared they had never before seen such a holy and happy death thanks to the intervention of m van der meersch already mentioned and who was a personal friend of the burgomaster of poparinghe mother prioress obtained permission to place the dead body having previously secured it in a double coffin in a private vault in the cemetery so that if which god grant we were able to rebuild our monastery at ypres we shall then lay dear dame josephine with her other religious sisters we recited the office of the dead round the holy remains in the convent chapel and sang the requiem mass at the funeral this latter should have really taken place in the parish church but the cure kindly sympathizing with our numerous trials offered to perform it at the convent so that we should be thus enabled to keep our enclosure as much as possible we sang the mass at which all attended with great devotion in spite of the severe colds we had all caught at the moment of consecration when in deepest recollection we adored our lord and our god who thus deigned to come down from heaven among his sorrowing children the well-known hiss of a descending bomb made itself heard and in the same moment a formidable explosion took place quite close to us the holy sacrifice continued without interruption it was only afterwards we heard that the germans had aimed at the ambulance established as has been said at la sante union missing us by a few yards only the bomb had struck the house next door doing however but little damage four girls of the congregation of our blessed lady carried the coffin to the cemetery while the nuns of the house accompanied our community the sad little procession wound its way along the muddy streets amidst troops of civilians and soldiers nearly all saluted as it passed the prayers being sung at the grave the coffin was deposited in the vault and we returned silently stopping to recite de profundes at the little portion of ground allotted to the dead nuns of la sante union
End of chapter 7Chapters 8 and 9 of The Irish Nun at Ypres by Dame Mary Columban. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. An Attempt to Revisit Ypres. When we arrived at the convent, we found that a soldier had called to say that a motor car would be starting for Ypres at 4.30, but which would not return until the next day. We felt hardly inclined to accept the invitation, but dared not miss the opportunity which would perhaps not present itself a second time. Mother Prioress and Dame Placid decided to go, and to pass the night in the abbey, and come back the following day in the motor. We were all so anxious at the idea that two of us, viz. Dame Columban and Dame Patrick, offered to go on foot to be able to help in case of danger. The narrative will be continued from the notes of Dame Columban and Dame Patrick. We set off at 2.30, as we should, of course, take longer than the motor. Two of the servants of Madame Boom, who were also in the convent, accompanied us to be able to see in what state her house was. At their suggestion we decided to follow the railway line instead of going by the high road, and thus we were spared the dreadful mud and constant traffic we should otherwise have had. On our way we met many poor people who were flying from Ypres, for the Germans were still shelling it. They tried their best to dissuade us from our purpose, depicting in vivid colors the great danger we were incurring. We, however, continued on our way. Several aeroplanes passed overhead, one of which received a volley of shots, so we knew it must have been an enemy. Sad to say, it escaped untouched. As we advanced, we heard the sound of the guns louder and louder, till at last we found ourselves once again in the noise and confusion we had left a week and a half ago. Our hearts beat faster as we began to distinguish in the distance the Tower of St. Martin's and of the Hall, and we hastened our steps, wondering if the motor-car, which was to bring Mother Pyrrhus and Dame Placid, were already there, and making plans as to what we should do for the night. The fugitives had told us that the Germans were principally shelling the station, so we determined to go round the town and come in by the Port de Menin, which would bring us immediately to the abbey. As we were thus settling everything in advance, we came to where the railway lines pass over the high road and were about to continue by the latter when a french policeman suddenly stopped us asking where we were going we bravely replied to ypres what was our dismay when he politely informed us that he was forbidden to allow any one to enter the town in vain we expostulated saying how far we had come that we only desired to see our monastery once again that it was quite impossible to walk back to poparine that night it was all useless as we spoke some poor persons endeavoured also to pass but were sent back we then asked the officer if he had seen a motor-car with two nuns in it he replied in the negative but promised to stop them should they pass he tried to mend matters by explaining that he was obliged to obey orders, and that it was to prevent deserted houses being broken into and robbed that persons were not allowed to enter the town. For, he said, people pass by empty-handed in the morning, saying they want to see their houses are still standing. They come back in the evening loaded with things. Is it their own belongings they have, or someone else's? This, however, did not console us, and we turned our steps disconsolately towards Boparinghe. It was nearly six o'clock. The cold wind beat pitilessly in our faces, for it was freezing hard. The stars were shining, but there was no moon, so the road was dark. Should we ever reach Boparinghe again? What if Mother Prioress and Dame Placid were waiting for us at the abbey? They would assuredly think we were killed. We walked slowly on, debating what was to be done. At last we decided to try to find a lodging for the night and get into Ypres the first thing in the morning. We stopped at the first group of houses which came in sight. What was our joy to see a motor outside? Perhaps we could get a ride home. We addressed ourselves to the French soldier who was standing by and asked if by chance he was going to Poparinghe that night. Yes, was the rather laconic reply, and would it be possible to take us also? That was another thing. 
we must wait for the officer who would be back perhaps in half an hour perhaps later then as if to excuse his apparent unwillingness the soldier told us they were strictly forbidden under pain of thirty days imprisonment to take any one in the motors as it had been discovered that german spies had been acting as chauffeurs to several french officers did we look like german spies be that as it may it was not inviting to think of waiting in the cold for half an hour or more and then meeting with a probable refusal we consequently returned to our first idea of getting a night's lodging we knocked at the first door but found the house full of french soldiers we went farther on and through a window saw some english tommies seated round the fire with the members of the family this looked more inviting we pushed the door open there being no sign of a bell or knocker and at our inquiry were told that the house was full there being four officers lodging there as well as the private soldiers we asked if it would be possible to speak to an officer and were requested to step inside our visit being announced a cheery voice called out entrez messieurs entrez we entered at the little room and found ourselves in presence of four officers who were actually engaged in making their tea and who were more than delighted on learning our nationality they were very interested in our story and pressed us to take tea with them we thanked them for their kindness but refused not wishing to deprive them of what they so well deserved two of them next offered to go in search of some means of conveying us back to poporinghe as we were not likely to find a lodging anywhere they were also sure that the officer had never left with mother prioress for as one of them remarked ypres is a very unhealthy place at the moment after some time the two returned saying they had found a french vehicle which would conduct us to within a mile of poporinghe so thanking our kind host we followed our two guides to the place where the carriage if so we might call it being rather a closed cart drawn by mules was standing the soldiers were busy unloading it as we were talking two lights appeared in the distance which rapidly grew bigger and brighter as a motor-car dashed past us the two officers soon chased it calling on the driver to stop he accordingly slowed down and we learned to our great delight that the officer an english one this time would take us straight to poporinghe we were soon spinning along the road leaving flamerting houses carts horses soldiers far behind us and in a good quarter of an hour we stopped at the door of la sainte union we begged our kind benefactor to accept something for our drive but he refused saying he was only too pleased to have been able to render us this little service as soon as we were safe inside we were surrounded all asking what had happened to us for every one had been more than anxious on our account owing to the alarming news which was brought from ypres we related our adventures in a few words and then had to go quickly upstairs to show ourselves to dear lady abbess who was greatly troubled over our absence and inquired constantly if we had yet arrived in our turn we now desired to know what had happened to mother prioress and dame placid so during recreation which we shared with the other nuns refugees like ourselves we heard of their doings after going out in search of the officer who was to take them to ypres and waiting in the rain and cold the soldier who had called in the morning found them and said the captain had been delayed and would not leave before four or four thirty they had then returned to the convent and set out once again this time taking the key of the abbey which they had previously forgotten arrived in the market square they saw a long row of motors drawn up with soldiers busy taking off the cakes of mud and mire which literally covered them in vain they looked for their driver at this moment a regiment of chasseurs francais rode by for a breast they had hardly gone when the dragoons with their uniforms of pale blue and silver galloped past also this state of things lasted almost an hour the captain not yet making any appearance they had gone in quest of something to take with them to eat in case no food should be found at ypres 
by a strange coincidence on entering the shop they were accosted by the manageress of one of the hotels of ypres who immediately recognized them at last on coming once more out into the square the soldier met them again saying that the bombardment was raging so fiercely that there was no question of leaving poporigny that afternoon it was useless to think of sending after us so every one had remained in the greatest anxiety until our return End of chapter eight chapter nine preparing to start for england reverend mother despairing of getting into ypres was now determined to leave poporigny and go to england but again the question presented itself how were we to get there as the english officers had been so kind to us in our efforts to get to ypres on the previous evening she thought that perhaps they would help us also for the journey dame teresa offered to accompany her as being the niece of mr redmond it was felt she might be specially useful so accompanied by dame columban and dame patrick mother prioress set out to try to find the officer who had given them seats in his motor the day before he had said he belonged to the aeroplane encampment which we knew to be just outside the town meeting an english soldier we asked him to be so kind as to show us the way on hearing our story he advised us to apply rather to another officer who would be better able to help us and directed us to the convent where this officer was staying the convent proved to be that of the penitents of st francis where we received a warm welcome and were introduced to two nuns from the hospice of ypres who had taken refuge there the captain in question was not in so the nuns insisted on our seeing their lovely little church and sacristy after which they found a soldier who conducted us to the british headquarters which were then actually at poporigny there we were received with the greatest courtesy by captain liddell who promised to do everything in his power to help us but advised us at the same time to apply to commandant del port of the belgian constabulary who would be better able than he to find a train to convey us to dunkirk or boulogne we thanked the captain and left to find the belgian police station having been directed several different ways we eventually arrived at our destination and were received by an official who promised to acquaint the commandant with the reason of our visit as soon as he should return he being absent at the moment we were about to leave when the door opened and monsieur le commandant del port entered and after courteously saluting us he begged us to take seats and showed the greatest interest in all that mother prioress related he then said that a train of refugees had left only the day before and he could not tell us when another would start he referred us again to the general staff saying that as we were british subjects they ought certainly to take us either in their ambulance cars or in a train for the wounded on account of our lady abbess who was paralyzed adding that he would speak in our favour we therefore turned our steps once more to where we had come from and having made known the result of our visit we were told to return the next day at one thirty p m before which time captain liddell would consult the chief medical officer and see what could be done for us we then took the road back to the convent where we were glad to find a warm shelter the next day was friday captain liddell had promised to call on us should anything be decided before one thirty the town was however suddenly thrown into a state of excitement by the passing of a german taube which dropped a bomb on st burton's church fortunately it only slightly injured the porch though it wounded several persons standing by amongst the injured was the chaplain of la sainte union whose hand was hurt we were next informed that the british headquarters had left the town what then would become of the arrangements for our journey to england immediately dame columban and dame patrick offered to go and see if any message had been left for us poor mother prioress being unwell and therefore not able to go herself the narrative is again continued from the notes of dame columban and dame patrick having received mother prioress blessing we started off wondering what we should find perhaps an empty house on our way we passed st burton's church where a group of persons were gathered watching french soldiers clearing the road of the remains of bricks stones glass which were strewn about 
every window in the whole street was broken hastening our steps we were soon in presence of captain liddell to whom we apologized for our early call relating what we had heard he said that the staff had no intention of leaving as yet that as to our journey it would take several days to arrange for different persons would have to be consulted the situation did not seem very satisfactory so on taking our leave we determined to have recourse once more to the belgian authorities just as we arrived in sight of the building to our great disappointment we saw the commandant leaving in company with two british officers we immediately drew back but recognizing us he came forward all three officers giving a military salute we begged him not to stop for us saying that we would call again but he insisted on bringing us into the house telling the officers he would rejoin them shortly we stated as briefly as possible the unsatisfactory result of our visit to the english headquarters and asked what was the best thing to do he told us that there was a train leaving the next day at two thirty p m but that in all probability we should not enjoy the company we of course declared that this did not matter however he told us to decide nothing as yet saying he himself would go to arrange with the british officers and would call on mother prioress next morning we thanked him profusely and once more turned our steps toward la sante union to acquaint reverend mother with the result of our negotiations End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Irish Nuns at Ypres by Dame Mary Columban. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: A Second Attempt to Revisit Ypres. Were we then to leave Belgium without seeing our beloved monastery again? The thought was too dreadful. This time, Dame Placid begged to be allowed to venture back and asked Dame Columban and Dame Patrick if they would go with her they at once agreed and having begged a blessing from mother prioress started off accompanied by the two servants of madame boone poor mother prioress being still unwell and quite unable to accompany them to her great disappointment dame columban and dame patrick will again tell the story we were now determined to succeed it was our last chance we had not gone far when the whir of an aeroplane was heard overhead it flew too low to be an enemy so we wished it good speed and passed on shortly after some fugitives met us who seeing the direction we were taking stared aghast and told us that the germans were bombarding ypres worse than ever should we turn back oh no it was our last chance we continued bravely soon others stopped us with the same story but turning a deaf ear to the horrors they related we pushed on over an hour had passed when after a brisk walk flammerting came in sight more than half our journey was accomplished just as we approached the railway station we had again taken the railway track we heard the whir of an aeroplane then a volley of shots flew up towards the aeroplane we knew what that meant we could see the shots of the allies bursting in the air some near the taube some far away alas none hid it what should we do we determined to risk it and passed under taube bombs shots and all we hastened through the railway station soldiers men women and children staring at the strange benedictine nuns hurrying on we met two priests coming from ypres we stopped to ask advice they told us that our undertaking was decidedly dangerous there was hardly a person left in the town they had gone in in the morning to see if they could be of any use and were now leaving not daring to stop the night they told us that there was still one priest who remained in the establishment of the mad people just outside ypres and that we could always call on him if we could not manage to reach our convent but they added that he also was leaving the next day with all his poor protégés we made up our minds to risk all so asking the priest's blessing we went our way other people tried in vain to make us turn back especially two men who assured us we should never be able to accomplish our project 
We thanked them for the interest they showed in our behalf, and asked them if they would be so kind as to call at the convent at Poperingi and tell Mother Prioress not to be anxious if we did not return that night, and not to expect us till the next day. We were now approaching the crossroads which had proved so fatal on Wednesday. A Belgian officer on a bicycle stopped to ask where we were going. We told him. He said it was simple madness to think of doing such a thing. He had been with his soldiers trying to mend the roads a little farther on, and had been obliged to leave off on account of the shells which were flying in all directions. We thanked him, but said we would risk it all the same. Arriving on the high road, we soon found ourselves in presence of a French policeman, who asked where we were going. To Ypres was the determined reply. No one can pass. You must go back. What were we to do? We determined to go on. Were there no means of getting by in another way? While we stood as though rooted to the ground, we caught sight of a French chasseur on the other side of the road, who seemed to have some authority, and who was trying to console a woman and two weeping children. We immediately applied to him and told him our distress. He answered kindly, but told us all the same that he was afraid we should not be able to enter Ypres. We begged to be allowed to continue, if only to try. He smiled and said, If you really wish it, then pass on. And on his writing down a passport, we went on triumphantly. It seemed as though God were helping us. We had been so taken up with all that had passed that we had thought of nothing else. But now that we were in sight of the goal, we realized that it was freezing hard. The stars were shining brightly from time to time, a light flashed in the distance, then a sinister whirr, followed by an explosion, which told us that the Germans were not going to let us pass as easily as did the French chasseur. Wondering as to how we should succeed, we came across an English sentinel, and so asked his advice. He told us that he thought there was no chance whatever of our getting into the town. He said that he himself had been obliged to abandon his post on account of the shells, that the troops in the town were being ordered to leave, and that those coming in had been stopped. We now remembered having seen a regiment of French soldiers setting out from Poparingue at the same time as we had done, and then they were suddenly stopped, while we went on and saw them no more. Despite what the sentinel told us, we remained unpersuaded. Seeing several soldiers going in and out of a house just opposite, we thought it would be as well to ask a temporary shelter till the bombardment should lessen. We ventured to ask admission, when what was our surprise to receive the warmest of welcomes and the kindest offers of hospitality. We could not have found a better spot. The family was thoroughly Christian, and in this time of distress the door of the house stood open day and night for all who were in need. How much more for nuns, and more especially enclosed nuns like ourselves. They had seen us passing on our way to Poparingue just a fortnight before, and had accompanied our wanderings with a prayer. A few days ago they had also given refreshment to the poor Clares, who had taken refuge at Flammerling and now their only desire was that god should spare their little house that they might continue their deeds of mercy and true charity to give us pleasure they introduced an irish gentleman who was stopping with them since the germans had chased him out of courtray a lively conversation soon began while the good woman of the house prepared us a cup of hot coffee and some bread and butter after this the irish gentleman whose name was mr walker went out to investigate to see if it would not be possible for us to continue our walk after about half an hour's absence during which we were entertained by our host m van der Gott, ten chaussee de poperingue ypres who made his five children and two nieces come in to say good night to us before going to bed mr walker returned saying it was a sheer impossibility to enter the town that evening as the shells were falling at the rate of two every three minutes he had called on m l'abbe neuville the priest above mentioned director of the asylum who said he would give us beds for the night 
and then we could assist at his mass at six thirty next morning the latter part of the proposition we gladly accepted but as to the first we were afraid of abusing his goodness and preferred if our first benefactor would consent to remain where we were until morning our host was only too pleased being sorry that he could not provide us with beds he then forced us to accept a good plate of warm buttermilk after which provided with blankets and shawls we made ourselves as comfortable as we could for the night needless to say we did not sleep very well and were entertained till early morning with explosions of bombs and shells and the replying fire of the allies guns once a vigorous rattling of the door handle aroused us but we were soon reassured by hearing m vandercourt inviting the poor half-frozen soldier who had thus disturbed us to go to the kitchen to take something warm before six we began to move and performed our ablutions as best we could the eldest son of the family now came to fetch us to show us the way to the church of the asylum where we had the happiness of hearing holy mass and receiving holy communion when mass was over we wound our way once more through the dimly lit cloisters of the asylum while we could not help smiling at the apparent appropriateness of the place we had chosen with the foolhardy act we were undertaking of risking our lives in thus entering a town which even our brave troops had been obliged to evacuate once outside the asylum we found mr walker waiting for us with the eldest daughter and three sons of m vandergott who were pushing a handcart we set off at a brisk pace along the frozen road passing by a few french soldiers who looked amazed at our apparition we soon entered the doomed town there a truly heart-breaking sight awaited us broken-down houses whose tottering walls showed remains of what had once been spacious rooms buildings half demolished half erect met our wondering gaze everywhere windows shattered in a thousand pieces covered the ground where we walked while in the empty casements imagination pictured the faces of hundreds of starving homeless poor whose emaciated features seemed to cry to heaven for vengeance on the heartless invaders of their peaceful native land but we durst not stop the thought ever uppermost in our hearts was our own beloved abbey how should we find it we pushed on as quickly as we could but the loose stones bricks beams and glass made walking a difficult matter and twice having passed halfway down a street we were obliged to retrace our steps owing to the road being entirely blocked by overthrown buildings here and there we saw some poor creature looking half frightened half amazed at seeing us while suddenly turning a corner we came to a pool of frozen water where three street boys were amusing themselves sliding on the ice their mirth seemed almost blameful among so many trophies of human misery we now came in sight of st peter's church which at first glance appeared untouched but coming round past the cavalry we saw that the porch had been struck one moment more and we were in la rue saint jacques nay in front of our dear old home the pavements were covered with debris of all kind but the other buildings had largely contributed to the pile we hardly dared to raise our eyes yet the monastery was there as before seemingly untouched save for the garrets over the nuns cells where the shell had burst before we had left we were now greeted by a familiar voice and looking round found the poor girl elaine who was anxiously inquiring if we were returning to the convent but there was no time to waste the germans who had stopped bombarding ypres at about three a m might recommence at any moment and then we should have to fly so we went to the door of the director's house to try to get into the abbey what was our astonishment to find oscar our old servant man there probably he was still more astonished than we for he had never dared to come to the convent since he had left and would surely feel at the least uncomfortable at our unexpected arrival however it was certainly not the moment to think of all these things so we went in the whole building seemed but one ruin in the drawing-room where the priest's breakfast things laid a fortnight before were still on the table the ceiling was literally on the floor 
the staircase was quite blocked with cement mortar wallpaper and bricks the sacristy where we had assembled when the first shell fell was untouched the church except for some five or six holes in the roof was as we left it but the altar stripped of all that had once made it so dear to us spoke volumes to our aching hearts mounting the seven steps which led into the choir we found ourselves once more in that beloved spot the windows on the street side were in atoms otherwise all was intact our dearest lord had watched over his house his royal state chamber where he was always ready to hold audience with his beloved spouses we tore ourselves away and flew to secure our breviaries great habits and other things which the other nuns had recommended to us everywhere we went dust and dirt covered the rooms while a great many windows were broken the statues of our blessed lady and st joseph were unharmed as also those of our holy father st benedict and our holy mother st scholastica little jesus of prague had his crown at his feet instead of on his head one crucifix was broken in two the cells were almost quite destroyed big holes in the ceilings the windows broken the plaster down frozen pools of water on the floor we hastened to the garrets where things were still worse the roof in this part was completely carried away leaving full entrance to hail snow and rain strong rafters and beams which seemed made to last unshaken till the end of the world were rent asunder or thrown on the floor the huge iron weights of the big clock had rolled to the other end of the garrets the scene of destruction seemed complete we turned away the other part looked secure the apples and pears lying rotting away on the floors where we had put them to ripen in the novice ship the ceiling was greatly damaged whilst down in the cloisters by the grotto of our lady of lourdes a bomb had perforated the roof the grotto remaining untouched these seemed to be the principal effects of the invader's cruelty as far as our abbey was concerned we now came across our old carpenter who had also come into the house with oscar and who had already put up planks on the broken windows in the choir promising to do all he could to preserve the building he also told us that one of the greatest german bombs had fallen in the garden but had not exploded so the french police had been able to take it away another mark of god's loving care over us for had the bomb burst it would have utterly destroyed our monastery we were now obliged to leave when should we see the dear old spot again and in what state would it be if we ever did return End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Irish Nuns at Ypres by Dame Mary Columban. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Return Journey to Poparinghe. The handcart being overloaded, we had to carry some of the things ourselves, and we must have looked a strange sight, carrying books and clothes stuffed in white pillowcases. Even Mister Walker had one, which he hoisted on his shoulder. We did not trouble about this, but silently made our way back through the deserted streets we left the town by a different way from that by which we had entered it as a sinister boom from the station warned us of the presence of the enemy our road took us this time through the grand place the whole back part of the hospital was destroyed and although the walls of the facade were still standing one could see through the empty windows that the interior was almost entirely demolished the cloth hall also had not been spared one corner being severely damaged and the greater number of the statues maimed and mutilated if it could have remained so there might have been some consolation but now every one knows the ruthless barbarity which has prompted the huns of the twentieth century to utterly destroy this wonderful monument of medieval architecture of which ypres had been so justly proud during hundreds of years it appears that the belfry the chimes of which were only surpassed by those of bruges and antwerp was struck just twenty-four hours after we had passed it on our exit from the town st martin's too had also been struck we could nevertheless have entered but mr walker was afraid to let us prolong our stay as the shells were already flying over us 
our thoughts naturally turn to the much revered and esteemed monsieur le doyen who victim of his heroic courage had remained at his post to the last tending the wounded and even helping to extinguish the fires which the incendiary bombs caused in so many places till at last seeing the interior of his beloved church already in flames he had fallen struck down by a cerebral congestion and had been carried to the dean of poporenge in the ambulance car since we have heard that he is better d g one of our old pupils having seen him in the church of poporenge on emerging from the town a little incident occurred we came up with a british cavalry regiment they were coming from the trenches they looked at us and shouted who are you sisters and where do you come from dame columban answered we are english nuns from the benedictine convent of the rue st jacques this was too much for dame patrick who called out we are no such thing we are irish benedictines irish shouted half a dozen of them and so are we and they all began singing it's a long way to tipperary and thus escorted we took a long last look at the dear old town needless to say it was an irish regiment every man wore the harp and shamrock on his collar and cap we soon arrived at the house where we had taken refuge during the night and were not sorry to have a good cup of coffee and some bread and butter and jam mr walker had told us of some of his experiences among which was the burning of madame la baron copin's house this lady being the mother of one of our former pupils monsieur van der Gott's eldest son had been left in charge of their house sleeping in the cellar at night on one occasion when the bombardment was raging fiercely mr walker had offered to accompany him they kept watch in turns as mr walker was sleeping the son woke him suddenly crying out quick get up the house is on fire half dazed he had seized hold of his candlestick and followed the son to the door all was in flames they turned back half stifled with the smoke but could find no exit at last they managed to break the glass of the window and jumping out just escaped from the place as with a loud crash the roof fell in mr walker had his candlestick still in his hand which he showed us among pieces of shrapnel and shells all souvenirs of the war they had also saved the dog which was slightly burnt we now hurried the preparations for our departure as time was passing quickly and we had still a long walk before us our kind host accompanied us as far as the crossroads where the french police mounted guard for he was not allowed farther by a strange coincidence we met once more the belgian officer who had seen us the evening before he was more than astonished at what we had done and was very pleased that all had succeeded so well we thanked m van der Gott warmly for all that he had done for us promising that if it were possible we should assuredly call on him on our return to ypres we then set off two of us pushing the cart we had taken but a few steps when a french official stopped us once more saying that no carts were allowed on the high road except those belonging to the army we had therefore to take a country lane which had the double inconvenience of being twice as long as the straight road and indeed of being also almost impassable however there was nothing to be done but to go forward as best we could so off we went oh dear one wanted goliath's strength to push the cart over the stones and ruts after a few yards we came to a dead stop the cart was stuck we pushed and pushed with might and main vain efforts we could not move it we were finally obliged to pull backwards and thus managed to extricate it taught by experience we took more care next time looking where we were going to so things went pretty well for about a hundred paces when glancing behind us what was our dismay to see a number of french soldiers coming by the same road some on horseback others on foot others driving carts there was only the narrow lane in front of us with no means of turning visible to the right or left what was to be done we hurried on as best we could but what was the use in ten minutes they would surely overtake us at last turning round a corner what was our relief to see an open gateway leading into a farmyard we boldly pushed our precious load in thus leaving room for the soldiers to pass 
we then tried if it were possible to find some one to help us because judging from the difficulties we had met with so far it was really questionable if we should arrive at poporinghe before evening after grumbling a bit two men offered to come with us as far as flamerting this was better than nothing and as we followed them we fervently prayed that we should meet with some one else later on on we trudged wondering what had happened in the convent since our departure what if the belgian commandant had found a train and every one had been obliged to leave without us no surely that was not possible we passed soldiers men women children wading through pools of mud and water and lamenting our long detour which had made us waste so much precious time flamerting at last still five long miles to poporinghe should we ever get there on arriving at the village our two good fellows set about finding some one else to push our cart and finally succeeded having paid them we set off once more on our journey when behold a barrier was placed across the road and we had to come to a standstill they told us a train was coming we looked and looked but saw no sign of it in either direction meanwhile a crowd of people assembled who accustomed to such proceedings pushed past right up to the railing to be the first to pass and we were left at the back we waited and waited still no train what a waste of time then came the sound of horses hoofs and up trotted a whole regiment of soldiers who of course rode to the front pushing the crowd back and us along with them still no train we now happened to look across to the other side of the barrier and discovered another regiment waiting on the opposite side with again a crowd of people behind them should we ever get through still no train decidedly the good man's watch must have been considerably in advance or else he possessed the virtue of prudence in its highest perfection at length a feeble whistle told us that the long-expected locomotive was coming but it must have been a train of wounded soldiers for first it moved forward at a snail's pace and secondly it seemed to our worn-out patients to be at least one mile in length however it passed at last and the barriers being withdrawn the two regiments crossed four abreast then the crowds pushed through and last but not least came the representatives of the irish benedictine abbey with their stylish looking handcart once more on we pushed but the five miles must have been german ones which like their dreadful soldiers never come to an end our guide kept bravely on from time to time stopping to wipe the perspiration off his face for although it was freezing the poor fellow had no light work to try to advance through the mud and dirt at last passing by some houses he left the cart in the middle of the road and vanished the reason soon became evident for a moment afterwards he came out with a glass of foaming beer wherewith to refresh himself once again on we went would the road ever come to an end would we ever arrive at our destination we scanned the horizon to find some vestige of our approaching goal but could discover nothing but an endless succession of trees hop gardens fields finally however some houses came in sight so plucking up our courage we pushed forward and soon reached the convent door at last we could get a rest alas how we were deceiving ourselves once inside we were soon surrounded by our sisters one more anxious than the other to know what had happened and to tell us what had been decided during our absence parcels of every shape and dimension next met our eyes arrived at the room which we generally occupied what was our astonishment to find our lady abbess downstairs surrounded by the nuns of both communities on catching sight of us she was more than delighted we knelt for her blessing and to tell her some of our adventures and then learnt the reason of all this excitement mother prioress will now tell what happened during the absence of dame columban dame patrick and dame placid as soon as the three nuns had set out for ypres we went to the chapel to recommend them to the protection of god and by a fervent subtuum we commended them to the care of the blessed virgin they had promised me to be back if possible that night 
or at least the next morning, if they could remain in the convent cellars without too much danger. At 3 p.m. I was called to see Captain Liddell, who told me that the British headquarters would place two ambulance cars at our disposal to conduct Lady Abbess and the community to St. Omer. The cars would be ready between 10 and 11 next morning. He also said that once at St. Omer I had only to address myself to the mayor or to the general staff. I thanked him profusely and told him of my anxiety for the three nuns who had gone to Ypres. It was a very imprudent thing to attempt, he answered. I trust they will not be allowed to enter the town, for it is being fiercely shelled. I was very alarmed, as were the rest of the community, to whom I related what the captain had said. In the evening we were assembled with the nuns from Osmentekirk in the big parlour, which the superioress had kindly allotted for our use. The gas being shut off, we had only one petrol lamp between us. We spent our time working and praying. From time to time, on hearing a ring at the bell, we would ask if the nuns had yet come back. One of the younger nuns would go and inquire, but always returned disappointed. We looked at each other anxiously. What would become of them this night? We could only recommend them to God. Suddenly I had an inspiration. Let us put them under the protection of St. Raphael, I said, and promise him a mass tomorrow. There are several priests at the ambulance. One of them will surely be free to say it. Everyone was pleased with the idea, and Dame Teresa went to make inquiries. She soon came back in triumph, saying that the priest from Avignon was outside. We told him our distress, and respectfully begged him to be so kind as to say the Mass in honour of St. Raphael for the safe return of our three absent ones. He willingly agreed. At the same moment, the appearance of the portress brought the cry to our lips, "'They're there!' no it is the commandant del port of the belgian police who wishes to speak to mother prioress i went to the parlour fear and hope alternately taking possession of my heart he came to ask if captain liddell had called and if the decision of the headquarters suited us i told him of the arrangement and added once at st omer what shall i do with our honoured lady abbess may she remain in the motor which they say must return to poparinghe that evening while I go to the mayor and general staff? He reflected a moment, and then, taking one of his cards, he wrote a few words recommending us to Major Kirk. Take this, he said, rising, and give it to the major, who is a great friend of mine, and rest assured that all will be well. I could not thank him enough, and conducted him to the door. There I found myself in presence of two men, who asked to see me. They brought me a message from our nuns, telling me not to be anxious. They would not return that night, but the next day, as soon as possible. I felt a little relieved, but again the question presented itself, at what hour would they arrive? Would they be in time? The next morning we arranged our modest parcels, which, thanks to the dexterity of Dame Aloysius, were soon ready, thinking all the time of our missing sisters. For my part, I went to prepare Lady Abbess for our departure, for the hour was fast approaching. We must come to a decision. The three must remain at La Santa Union until the opportunity of joining us in England should present itself. We had now to get Lady Abbess down the stairs, which were narrow and steep, and it was with the greatest difficulty that we succeeded. We made her as comfortable as we could in an armchair in the big parlour, where the nuns of the three communities gathered round her, for every one was filled with an affectionate respect for her, mingled with compassion for her age and infirmity. We tried to hide our perplexity and anxiety from her. It was now time to start, and the three were not yet back. At this moment the portress entered the room, smiling. What was it? Captain Liddell had just called to say the motors would not be round till one-thirty, Deo gratias. To complete our happiness, the absent ones soon arrived, covered with dust and mud, but producing in triumph the great habits and breviaries they had been able to save. End of chapter 11「Chapters 12 and 
Chapter 12. On the Way to England. There was now no time to waste. The few treasures we had brought with us were promptly added to the other packages, while it was decided that each nun should wear her great habit as much to lessen the number of parcels as to preserve us from the cold, especially when crossing the sea. We bade adieu to the superiors and community of La Santa Union, who had given us such a warm welcome, and shown us such hospitality during the past fortnight. They ask us, in return, to beseech our Lord not to allow the Germans to bombard Poparenge, that they might be able to stop in their convent, which they had only built during the last eleven years since the French government had driven them from Hasbrook. A ring at the door interrupted our adieu. The voice of a British officer was heard, asking if this were the convent where the Irish dames of Ypres had taken refuge. The answer was soon given, and while some one went to help Lady Abbess, others seized the baggage, and all were soon at the door, where a group of wondering children and other people were assembled to see what would be the end of such an unusual sight. The great difficulty was to get our venerable invalid into the car, for although able to walk fairly well when helped on both sides, it was almost impossible for her to mount the two small steps. However, the soldiers soon came to the rescue, and with the help of their strong arms, she was soon established comfortably in a corner of one of the motors, enveloped in a blanket and numerous shawls to keep out the cold. The rest of the community were not long in getting in the motors, and Edmund brought up the rear with a young Irish girl, Miss Keegan, who had been trying to get home since the war broke out, and had now begged to be allowed to make the journey with us. Owing to the heavy fall of rain and the unusual traffic, the roads were in a very bad condition, and consequently our ride was not of the smoothest. But no accident occurred. Being frosty weather, the wind was bitterly cold, and we were obliged to keep everything closed that Lady Abbess might not be inconvenienced. She, however, kept up bravely. We did not forget to say the subtuum, nor to invoke our good St. Raphael with a fervent Angeli Archangeli, to which we added the prayer for travellers about half-way our kind guides came round to the entrance of the cars to know if we wanted anything we passed through several villages and small towns surrounded by snow-covered fields and frozen ponds nothing of note happened to vary the monotony of the continual shaking of our motors a little after five p m we came to a standstill and looking out found ourselves in what seemed to be a good-sized town we were not left long in suspense, for soon the cheery face of the officer in charge appeared, inquiring where we wished to be driven, for we were at St. Omer. Mother Prioress then produced the letter of recommendation given her by Commandant Delport for Major Kirk. The officer took the card, and soon we moved off in another direction. After a few minutes' run, we came again to a halt, stopping some time the officer then reappeared saying that the major was absent and asking where we would like to go now alas we did not know and wondered if it would not be advisable to go straight on to boulogne that same evening to take the boat the first thing next morning the officer seeing our perplexity vanished once more soon we were bowling through busy streets lined with shops well lit another stop a few minutes wait and off we were again a third halt then another officer appeared saluted and asked in excellent french if he could render us any service or replace major kirk who was absent from st omer on hearing our situation he told us that if we would just step out we should find accommodation in the establishment before which the cars had stopped as he was still speaking the persons who kept the house came out helping us down taking the parcels from us and seeming more than delighted at our arrival we were not sorry to leave the cars for we were quite cramped with the long cold drive the next question was how to get lady abbess out of her corner and into the house at last the officer in charge had the bright idea of carrying her on a stretcher accordingly one was brought down and laid on the seat opposite we then helped her to sit on the stretcher and induced her to lie down she was at first afraid, not being accustomed to this novel mode of conveyance, 
but being reassured she allowed the soldiers to carry her into the house and she was soon seated at a comfortable armchair by a blazing fire after expressing our gratitude to the good soldiers we rejoined lady abbess and soon made acquaintance with our kind hostesses what was our delight to find that they were secularized ursuline nuns and that the house had formerly been a convent of la sante union it is therefore unnecessary to state that we were received with the greatest charity a bed being even carried down to the room where we were for lady abbess so that she should not be obliged to go upstairs poor edmund had once more to be sent off being conducted to almost the other end of the town much to his distress after a good supper we retired to rest in what had once been the children's dormitory and fatigued by such an eventful day we slept well next morning we were awakened by the deep tones of church bells they were ringing the six o'clock mass at the cathedral which was quite close to the convent we arose and arrived in time for a late mass we were shown to seats almost at the top of the church after a few moments we heard the sound of soldiers marching and soon we had to give place to them for we had come to a military mass celebrated by an army chaplain two by two the soldiers advanced being marshalled to right and left by an officer it was an irish regiment and there were altogether about seventy soldiers who attended devoutly to holy mass and more than one when the moment of holy communion came mingled with those who approached the altar after mass we were conducted back to the convent promising ourselves a visit during the day to see the many objects of devotion and interest in the venerable cathedral we were not disappointed amongst other antiquities is a descent from the cross by rubens and oil paintings in memory of a visit which holy king louis the ninth and charles the tenth paid to the cathedral in thanksgiving for the success of their arms the sacred vessels also were for the most part of great antiquity especially a very ancient pyx ornamented with filigree work besides the high altar in the middle of the sanctuary having the stalls for the bishop and canons behind there were numerous side altars among which the most remarkable was that dedicated to our blessed lady of miracles this miraculous statue was held in great veneration by the inhabitants of the town and in the great peril they had gone through some weeks past when the germans were advancing on st omer and when the british had saved it by arriving only just in time for had they come but half an hour later the enemy would have been before them in the moment of peril the people had promised our blessed lady to give a new bell to the cathedral if she kept the dreaded invaders from entering the city ex votos without end hung all round the altar besides numberless engravings in thanksgiving for miracles and cures obtained through our lady's intercession after our interesting visit we stopped for vesters which since the beginning of the war were sung by the entire congregation during which time we profited to say our own vespers and compline we then went to visit m le cure de Furness, who we knew was stopping at st omer mother prioress desiring to have news of her cousin the dean of Furness, who we heard was at boulogne we also had the pleasure of saluting m le vicaire on our way we met some soldiers from morocco easily distinguished as arabs by their bright blue tunics and long scarlet cloaks with their big turbans their blankets thrown around them and their lovely horses when we returned to the house we learned that lieutenant stuart hayes who had been so kind to us on the previous evening had called to see reverend mother he had likewise left a message to say that he would try to assist at benediction in the evening and afterwards he would come round again he would be also very grateful if before his visit mother prioress would make out all that was necessary for our passports all being finished we set out for the cathedral once again for although there were still twenty minutes before benediction yet at st omer as nearly everywhere else the churches since the beginning of hostilities were crowded and those who before never put their foot inside a church were now amongst the most fervent so to secure our places we had to be there in time 
the rosary was first said aloud the priest ascending the pulpit so as to be better heard by every one after the o salutaris repeated alternately by the choir and congregation the miserere was sung the people repeating the first lines between each verse of the psalm there was something particularly touching in that cry for mercy which arose from every heart at the thought of the dear ones who perhaps even at that very moment were being shot down on the battlefield but what made the most impression was the hymn sung after benediction and which still rings in our ears that ardent supplication to la bonne mère vierge de esperance éteint sur nous ton voile sauve sauve la france ne abandonne pas it was truly a prayer in the real sense of the word beseeching the mother of mercy not to forsake the land she had so many times miraculously saved and where but a short while before had been seen such a wonderful outburst of faith at the eucharistic congress of lourdes the spot chosen by our blessed lady herself and where the devotion to the son had ever been united to that of the mother the sound of the grand old organ greatly enhanced the beauty of the singing and our hearts also mounted to the throne of mercy in behalf of our well-beloved abbey which we were now leaving so far behind soon afterwards returning to our lodgings mother prioress received the promised visit of the lieutenant accompanied by a military priest he brought all the necessary papers with him together with a recommendation for the governor of boulogne and took away our passports to have them signed reverend mother told him she would like so much to have a mass celebrated the next day in honour of st raphael for our safe voyage he promised to see if it would be possible and true enough he returned a short time after with the good news that not only should we have a mass said at which we could assist but that he had obtained permission for the priest to accompany us as far as moulin we were now in jubilation and proceeded once more to arrange our packages the night soon passed and next morning we proceeded to the cathedral wondering where we should find our priest whom we did not know and had never seen at the high altar preparations were being made for a funeral so we passed to the chapel of our lady of miracles where a mass was already half finished hoping that our priest would perhaps say the next one towards the end he came himself to look for us and told us he would not be able to come to our lady's altar as all the masses there were reserved but that he would commence immediately at st anthony's so we crossed over to the other side of the cathedral where father flynn as we afterwards found out he was called said mass at which we all received holy communion after breakfast we made the last preparations and about ten three ambulance cars drove us to the house the exiled nuns helped us as much as they could giving us each a postcard with a view of the convent as a souvenir of our visit they were sorry to see us leave and told us to be sure and to call on them again if we should ever repass by st omer the soldiers now came in with a stretcher for lady abbess and the nuns were so good that they insisted on lending a mattress blankets and pillows which would be returned with the cars having placed lady abbess on this portable bed the soldiers carried her out with the greatest care father flynn presiding and enlivening the whole proceeding with irish wit we were soon seated in the cars but had some time to wait as mother prioress was obliged to get a little money changed meanwhile several people came to speak to us among whom was the sister of one of our former pupils who recognizing our habit came forward to know what had happened to the abbey after a little while reverend mother returned but still the cars did not start we soon learnt the reason when lieutenant stuart hayes appeared triumphantly with a bottle of light wine and a box of biscuits which he insisted on our accepting we could not thank him enough for all that he had done for us but he withdrew immediately after making sure we had all we desired and courteously saluting us he gave word for the motors to start and we were soon on the road to boulogne it was bitterly cold so we kept the car in which lady abbess was lying well covered just outside st omer a british aeroplane mounted from the aviation field this was the last we saw of active hostilities 
father flynn kept the conversation going and between the prayers and hymns endeavoured to enliven the company he told us he was the first catholic chaplain to arrive with the troops in france he was going to the front on the following wednesday let us hope that he will be spared after running along for some time as smoothly as was possible considering the bad state of the roads the inmates of one of the motors heard a crack like a report of a revolver at the same instant the car stood stock still the two others following necessarily did likewise on inquiry it was discovered that a tire had burst which meant a little halt on the way as we were just outside a village the inhabitants though accustomed by this time to british soldiers passing by were not accustomed to seeing nuns with them and consequently crowded round to examine us a little nearer none being brave enough to ask where we came from they solved the problem themselves and christened us les petits soeurs de la croix rouge a title which i am afraid we hardly deserved the country through which we passed seemed very picturesque judging from the glimpses we got from time to time by lifting up the flap at the end of the car fields covered with snow gradually sinking in gentle slopes or rising in the distance in hilly ranges from time to time a woody glade would change the monotony of the succeeding meadows then a small village with its quaint little houses as we were thus putting more and more distance between belgium and ourselves a sudden crash soon broke the reigning silence the leading motor having drawn up when at full speed the two others not expecting this had run one on top of the other we were all thrown over on our seats and so remained not daring to move for fear of what might happen next the truth was that the first car owing to a rapid run down a slippery hill had charged into a telegraph post and that was the cause of our being roused so unceremoniously out of the dreams of old lang syne the driver soon appeared to make excuses for the fright they had unwillingly given us saying that there was no harm done except for a window broken we were quite reassured and started off again lady abbess had fortunately not realized the danger and only asked what the noise meant and why we had stopped we rolled on once more but our guide soon came to the conclusion that they had mistaken their way so consulting their maps they turned back up hill and down again going at the same flying pace we at last arrived in the historic old town of boulon there we still continued to mount and descend for the streets seemed all very steep it was now between two thirty and three p m and the boat would not leave till four we decided it would be better to stop in our cars as it was hardly according to the nature of our vocation to go about sightseeing and if we got down we should only stand shivering in the cold the motor-car in which were lady abbess and mother prioress was next driven off to the governor's house and having drawn up father flynn alighted to arrange everything for us we patiently awaited his return little dreaming of the honour which was being prepared for us till we saw the governor coming in person to salute the superioress reverend mother having returned his greeting told him of the great kindness we had everywhere received from the british headquarters at which he expressed the hope that we would experience the same from the french he then introduced lieutenant Trayard, to whom he gave us in charge with directions to see us all safely on board with truly french gallantry the lieutenant saluted the company and father flynn carefully pocketing his precious papers and jumping up by the chauffeur the car with lady abbess and mother prioress rejoined the rest of the community our conductors who were evidently hungry now produced bread tinned meat and cheese one buying some potato chips promptly came to share them with us we declined to accept them thanking him all the same for his kindness we thought we could not do better than follow their example so mother prioress divided lieutenant stuart hayes biscuits among us father flynn produced a packet of chocolate and then each in turn drank some wine from the solitary little mug we had brought in case lady abbess should want anything on the way as the soldiers seemed very cold stamping their feet on the frozen road reverend mother gave them also a drop of wine 
and for one who refused having probably taken the pledge she warmed some milk with the little spirit lamp we had they were all delighted poor fellows it was the least we could do for them when they had rendered us such good service captain dwyer who had brought our papers from the general staff to lieutenant stuart hayes when we were at st omer now joined us once more having been sent to boulogne with dispatches to assure himself of our safety our long stay ended by exciting the curiosity of the bystanders and we received rather indiscreet visits of persons who apparently passing innocently by the cars lifted up the flap to look in some ventured to talk and we discovered one poor man who said he came from the rue saint jacques ypres and an old woman who had walked all the way from dismoon at last it was time to go on board the boat the ambulance cars took us quite close to the gangway when we had all got down with our parcels the soldiers lifted the stretcher on which lady abbess was lying and gently carried her on board and into the cabin where we helped her on to a sofa lieutenant Triar superintended everything and good father flynn made fun all the time the latter then gave special injunctions to reverend mother about the papers and so forth and giving us his blessing with a special one to lady abbess having in his turn begged hers with all possible wishes for a safe arrival at our destination he hurried off the boat which was preparing to leave the passage was very calm but cold and frosty for more than one of us it was the first crossing lady abbess having up to this time never even seen the sea and sad to say nearly all proved bad sailors except curiously enough lady abbess happily however the passage only lasted one hour and twenty minutes so we were soon at folkestone thanks to our papers from british and french headquarters we were passed successfully by the doctor and other officials who stopped two belgian peasants following us ashore even edmund got through without the least difficulty arrived in the station a telegram was sent to a relative of one of the community in london who kindly looked out lodgings for us in advance it seemed an interminable time before the train set off and afterwards rushing through the darkness passing station after station town after town we thought london would never come however all things come to an end and so did our journey as at last we steamed into victoria station there one would have said we were expected we were so kindly received by the ladies on the platform who helped us out and pressed us to take something on hearing where we had come from and how we had succeeded in getting honoured lady abbess safe through so many difficulties every one was more than interested and soon porters were running in all directions to get cabs to convey us to our destination which was in quite another part of london a bath chair was brought for lady abbess who was wheeled out of the station mother prioress holding her hand one of the ladies seeing the impossibility of getting her into a cab fetched a private motor-car the gentleman who owned it helped by a soldier lifted lady abbess gently in then they drove to the hospital of saints john and elizabeth whither it was thought better for the present to take lady abbess the soldier overcome by the sight of our dear abbess patience took her in his arms exclaiming when he came downstairs i could not help it she is such a dear good old lady dame patrick's aunt mrs adamson had arranged everything for us and so dame patrick with mother prioress and dame columban were cordially received at her house lady abbess remained at the hospital of saints john and elizabeth where indeed she received every attention together with seven other members of the community dame teresa dame aloysius and dame walburga experienced the same charity at the sisters of hope edmund was also taken in at mrs adamson's those at the hospital and the sisters of hope heard mass there next morning and mother prioress dame columban and dame patrick walked as far as the dominicans at averstock hill we may here note the loving goodness of divine providence which had not once allowed us to miss mass or holy communion in spite of all the dangers and fatigues of the past weeks we were truly like the israelites in the desert for whom the manna never failed
End of chapter 12. Chapter 13. Ulton. Next morning we were all motored from our different lodgings to Ouston Station, where we were met by Mr. Nolan, brother of Rev. Dom Nolan, O.S.B., and at 10.30 we entered on the last stage of our never-to-be-forgotten journey. We had three reserved compartments at our disposal by the kind intervention of a gentleman at Victoria Station, who had given a signed card to Mother Prioress, telling her to show it to anyone who should question her and so we travelled safely from ypres to olten how strange it seemed for more than one of us to pass by those scenes which we had thought never more to see in this life we had left our country home and all to shut ourselves up in the peaceful solitude of ypres abbey and here we were forced to retrace our steps and to return temporarily to the world which we had willingly given up god was however preparing us another place of refuge from the turmoil of babylon into which we had suddenly been thrown after changing trains at stafford where lady abbess experienced the same considerate compassion which had been shown to her all along we arrived at stone station there we were met by some of the pupils of olton abbey who told us how every one was expecting us and how they had tried during the past weeks to obtain news of us but always unsuccessfully two dominican nuns from the stone convent next came forward to greet us one being an old prince thorpian school companion of dame columban and dame theresa the carriages awaiting us were soon full and as there was not room for all four of us offered to walk we lost nothing by this for passing by stone the two dominican nuns who had so kindly come to the station to meet us obtained permission for us to visit their convent we went all round the church the community were singing vespers in their choir and then through the cloisters which reminded us of the dear abbey we had left behind we saw the community room and several others and lastly found ourselves in the parlour where we awaited the honoured visit of reverend mother prioress we passed an agreeable time till the sound of carriage wheels told us that one of the vehicles which had already been up to olton had returned to fetch us our honoured lady abbess and the community were received with open arms at st mary's abbey it was with true motherly affection that lady laurentia opened the doors of her monastery to receive the ypres community the two communities olten and ypres have always been closely united and one of the first thoughts of the olten nuns on the outbreak of this dreadful war in belgium was for the abbey at ypres as early as september seventeen the lady abbess had written and offered us a home in case we had to leave our monastery but for some weeks we had refused to believe that this would ever happen when we arrived we found the lady abbess and community assembled to receive us and also the chaplain monsignor sherville who was no stranger as he had often visited us at ypres when staying with his friends at bruges we were very pleased to see him again by degrees we learned the trouble we had unwittingly caused the nuns for a letter which mother prioress had written five days before from poporine to announce our arrival had only come that morning and the telegram from london had followed almost immediately every one had been obliged to set to work to prepare for our accommodation two large rooms were placed at lady abbess's service there were only two cells free so one was allotted to mother prioress and the other to dame placid the rest of the choir dames were comfortably established in a dormitory of the new building only completed since the month of october the lay sisters found beds in another large room and so our wanderings came to an end no one save those who have suffered as we have suffered can realize the joy which we experienced in finding ourselves once more in the calm and quiet of monastic life where holy mass and communion the singing of the divine office meditation and spiritual reading succeeding the varied duties of the day tend to soften the memories of the scenes of bloodshed and wretchedness which can never be forgotten yet the echoes of this war of horrors reach us even in our haven of rest as i write news reaches us from our chaplain m de Zegur, principal du collège episcopal ypres who has returned to ypres to find his college entirely pillaged and almost in ruins 
he says that a third of the population has already re-entered the town all are in dismay at the heart-rending sight which meets their gaze as to our convent he writes the state of your abbey is also deplorable the shells have made great havoc there the french soldiers occupy it at present in several places the water is rising in the cellars god alone knows what we shall still see for the bombardment is not yet finished and now what has god in store for us we know not when shall we return to brave little belgium and how shall we rebuild our monastery which as has been said should this very year celebrate its two hundred and fiftieth anniversary god in his own good time will raise up kind friends who will come to our assistance of this we cannot doubt in confidence patience and prayer we shall therefore await the moment chosen by him who has said seek first the kingdom of god and all these things i e temporal gifts shall be added to you meanwhile we beg the father of mercy and the god of all consolation to have pity on the world and put an end to the dreadful punishment which weighs so heavily on our unfortunate generation may he enlighten our enemies that realizing the injustice of their cause they may be converted and cease their cruelties may he also in his infinite goodness purge the entire universe from the crimes which have degraded humanity and brought it down to the level of ancient paganism so that all seeking only his greater honour and glory may unite in the canticle of praise which holy church places on our lips during the holy sacrifice of the mass and which first resounded on bethlehem's plain round the crib of our common redeemer gloria in excelsis deo et in terra pax hominibus bonae voluntatis end of chapter thirteen end of the irish nuns at ypres an episode of the war by dame mary columban